Good evening. I'd like to call the meeting of the Cunningham Town Board to order. It's Monday, August 5th. Will the clerk please call the roll? Trustees Brown? Here. Hazen? Hersey? Here. Jacobson? Here. Miller? Here. Roberts? Wu? Here. Mayor Marlin? Here. Next up is minutes of the previous meeting, July 1st. Um, July 1st, 2019 public hearing, a July 8th joint meeting, and a July 15th joint meeting. Is there a motion for approval? I move approval of the minutes. I'll second. Moved by Jared, seconded by Bill. Are there any corrections? Okay, seeing none, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 All those opposed, same sign. That motion passes. Are there any additions to the agenda? Okay. Public participation. Does anyone wish to address the Cunningham Town Board? Seeing none. First, next up is Committee to Verify Bills. That's the Town Fund and General Assistance Fund. Danielle. Good evening. So for the Town Fund, we have $93,838.65. For the General Assistance Fund, we had $55,836.70. And that totals uh, $95,775.35. Um, and I just, I have also provided the credit card statement and it, I know that it covers a different time frame than the town bills. Um, in the future, I'd like to just download the statement for the time period of the town bills, which will make it easier, but any questions about the bills? Go ahead. Mary Alice. Um, mine is more of a procedural question. So I noticed that there was uh, some charges for an admin staff lunch meeting on mm -hmm. this month's bills. I'm wondering if we have uh, specific uh, rules outlined in terms of when we will pay for lunch and when we will not. I know that there is there's travel and accommodations. There's a specific like process per diem, but I don't believe there's anything specific to luncheons. When I take my team out over lunch, because there's no other time for me to meet with them, I usually purchase lunch for them. Um, so it's a rare occasion, but I took the admin team out and we talked about the future year. And I believe um, Wayne at times will take staff out and if they're doing work, they will pay for lunch. Okay, I just, I guess I'm, I'm worried. I, this doesn't seem excessive. I just want to clarify that. Um, no, nope, it's not. But I, I know that there have been issues in other public bodies with paying for lunch for employees. So I'm wondering if maybe we should write down some guidelines in terms of when that is allowed. Um, and mm -hmm. I'd like to see something like that. I don't know if the I can board has other thoughts the on that. I city of Abbott Template or the other or township, city of Champaign Township. That would be great. Jared, comment? I, I just imagine we need to establish a budget for it. If it's going to be, if we're okay with them spending some X amount on it, right? I mean, that's how I've always done it in other business working. This is, this is sure. X, X dollars for, you know, this amount of lunches per year, and you, you blow it all in a month, and well, you're as well. <laughs> Eric? Yeah, so I, I think a dollar amount would be would be reasonable. It's a different situation at the university. The university, we only put um, meals on an account if there's a visitor, and we're taking that visitor out, but that would not pertain here. But I think it's reasonable for there to be some amount budgeted for it. Just a quick question. Does this, has this come up at the city council? Is it something that you all have a policy about or you've legislated a policy or a specific budget? It's a great question. I, it hasn't come up while I've been on council. Okay. Yeah, to my memory, I do not remember it coming up previously. Okay. So, uh, Might be something to look for both bodies since you serve in both capacities. Yes. One mm -hmm. of many things that we may have overlooked and mm -hmm. suddenly occurred to us. Mm -hmm. Since it's Mary Alice came on the council. We, <laughs> what, for folks' birthdays, for staff birthdays, we typically buy cupcakes or tamales if they're not into sugar or, or you know, we patronize the downtown business. That's pretty standard. Can I ask, Diane, do you know if there's a city policy on when we pay for food? Just, it yeah. depends, on, um, depends on the occasion. 
I know for, for example, when we pay for food for city council, it comes out of individual city council members' um, allocations. Um, That's nice to know. Okay. We can get the copy of the what we've got. I think each department. Pardon, John. As I recall, the the best of my recollection is we would only uh, pay for staff lunches when they're hosting a job candidate coming in from outside. As an example. Um, of a different way, we're talking about when we have a staff meeting, then basically, I don't know how other departments, I would assume it would be the same way I've paid for our staff to have, when we have staff meetings. Or if we bring in food, we pay for that out of pocket. Yeah, typically, um, if I take staff out to lunch, I pay for it. Or Carol so does the same. Maybe it would be an opportunity for us to just kind of standardize that across okay. both bodies. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I do it. Sharice? I just, okay, so, but, but she's talking about that they're doing a working lunch, right, Danielle? Correct. So it's a working lunch, mm -hmm. and to me that kind of changes things in the sense that um, labor rules, you know, say that you can have this much time for lunch, but if that time is being taken up with a meeting, then I don't see why the staff would have to pay to eat and work. They're Correct. still working. That's our opinion. <laughs> that I, so. I, 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 this, we can go back and forth on this. I just think it would be good to have guidelines so everybody's clear in terms of when it's appropriate and when it's not appropriate. Mm -hmm. So I, I'm not saying no, it's I, not appropriate. I'm just saying it would be yeah. nice to have it written down and to have some guidelines. That, um, and and that's, 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 you know, I, I understand that. I just, it just seems that we were getting off into something else. Well, we have guests, we do this. And, but the thing is that she's talking about, this is a working lunch. Um, for all intents and purposes, they have, because it's their lunch, they could actually go someplace else and pay for it themselves and not show up for a meeting. You're enticing the people to be there you know, by saying, we'll pay for your lunch, please stay here so we can have a staff meeting or whatever it is. And so I don't see why, I, wouldn't, I would not expect um, people who for legally have the right to have a break, a lunch break, um, I would not expect them to pay for lunch if, I'm, if, if in fact they're doing a working lunch. Well, I'd say we'll start with what we've got in the city and let you look at that. Jared. I'd like to move a approval of the town fund and the general assistance fund. I'll second. Moved by Jared, second by Mary Alice. Any further discussion? All those in favor, please say aye. 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 All those opposed? That motion passes. Uh, reports of officers. So uh, general assistance participants continues to bounce up and down. We're starting to see some regularity between 100 and 115. We are down to 104 this past month. Um, you may recall last month we were at 113. Um, we have 46 participants in the community workfare program. 58 of our participants are disabled seeking SSI support. 31 are homeless. It, that tends to bump up now, but it stays pretty close to that number. Um, the good news is we have a new tracking system for housing stability. So we basically have folks coded as red, uh, yellow, and green. Um, actually, it's red, orange, yellow, and green. So we have a uh, crisis um, at risk, a high risk, unstably housed, low risk, unstably housed, and um, stably housed is green. So we are in the process of basically sorting every participant we've worked in, worked with into these categories. And I'm hoping to actually have like even more robust statistics for the town board. Um, part of this is our campa campaign is to move everyone into stable housing um, with available resources. And we can't do that unless we can track where folks are at. But right for now, we have the homeless stats. Um, I have broken down, we have more fine grained information about ages in the past. I've just given 
Um, average ages, you can now see ranges of ages. Uh, for rental assistance, we served 14 households. That was the same as last month. Um, this is, we uh, have launched a countywide rental assistance program, um, and we're seeing an increase, but it's not a, it's not a dramatic increase, but basically from about nine, eight to nine each month to that 14 range, um, which is still within what we budgeted for the year. Uh, I do want to invite the town board members and members of the public to our next um, garden celebration. It'll be this Wednesday, August 7th, from 5.30 to 7.30 p.m. Um, it is a partnership with the City of Urbana's Public Arts Program, um, as well as the Urbana Champaign Independent Media Center, uh, which they together have launched this project, Open Siena, and their next open mic will be in the garden. Uh, we'll highlight Emily McCowan, who was actually our garden intern last year and responsible for much of the infrastructure. Um, and she's really interested in, um, uh, uh, she wants to kind of focus on our collective empowerment and healing in the face of trauma. So we're inviting folks to share stories, songs, poetry, performance. You can show up and sign up uh, that evening. Um, and we will have food uh, there. We, we received a discount from Piatto's Catering and we, um, we appreciate um, their contribution. So they're basically giving us at cost food on Wednesday night. Any questions? Okay. Um, thank you, Daniel. Sure. Uh, we don't have unfinished business listed under new business. Ordinance number T 2019-08-002, transfer of appropriation ordinance, Cunningham Township budget. So essentially each year we have a transfer of appropriation ordinance to balance out the budget from the year before. Um, what you'll see is essentially in places where we went over, we've made some transfers in places where we went under, we transfer to, we are limited to uh, Ten percent of transfers. We are we were able to keep under that cap. Um, I think the most significant um, over budget was our legal expenses because we simply didn't know exactly when the Carl case uh, was going to go to trial. Um, it was expensive because going to trial is expensive, and um, so a lot of it, a lot of the monies are transferred um, to the legal front from other places we were under budget. Overall, we are under budget for the year, um, so that's good news. Just slightly, we are close to, um, but under budget, and uh, I'm asking for authorization to make these transfers based on last year's budget. Can we have a motion to get this on the table and then discussion? I, so, I move approval of, uh, of the transfers as described within the document. Okay, we'll move by Eric, seconded by Jared. Thank you. Okay, questions, Mary Alice? So, um, looking over this, some of this is really small, six cents and mm -hmm. so forth mm -hmm. under different lines here. Um, uh, but two things kind of stood out for me. One was that um, there was a line item of $7,000 for building repairs and maintenance um, that wasn't spent this year. So, I'm curious if there were certain projects that were put off mm -hmm. um, and was the reason for that being put off due to the concern for the budget? So, yes and yes. When we saw our legal fees uh, at the level that they were, we essentially, um, there were some optional items. We'd like to, we want to make some energy efficiency improvements and some improvements to our lobby. Uh, essentially, we made new improvements except to uh, meet with Scott Tess and meet with Amarin and have some energy efficiency um, kind of scope of works done. So we would understand, because our energy bills are still around $500 a month, which makes no sense at all. Um, and so we're in the process. We'd like to, we've, we fixed a few things. Our radiators were stuck open in the lobby, and that was a piece. Um, and so we were able to fix those. But in terms of the big scale issues, we, we haven't. We did budget for those in this year. So we're hoping that we'll be able to get to those pieces with this budget year. Okay, and am I, I can, can I ask my second question? Sure. Although it's more of a statement to the board because I don't believe Wayne is here tonight, is he? Um, so the other thing that was large in terms of the amount um, that we are changing aside from the legal 
um, that w came a bit as a surprise was the travel and the training from the town fund and assessor. Um, we had a really large conversation during the budget last year and this year regarding how much money we were um, going to allocate for, for training and travel, which we settled on a temporary of 20000 last year because of new employees that were coming on board. Um, and we had that conversation again this year. Um, and now we have an increase of $12,000. So that, that's a huge increase. So I, I just kind of wanted to draw that attention to the board because if we're going to have these conversations about how much money we're allocating to these types of things and then at the end of the year to balance the budget, we're, we're getting like a 50% increase in that budget line. I think it's something to keep in mind. Um, I'll certainly reach out to Wayne since he's not here tonight to ask him for clarification on that. But I just wanted to bring that to the board's attention. Thank you. Eric, you had a comment? Um, a question and then maybe followed by a comment. The question is, do you have an estimate for the improvements in energy efficiency? Do you have an estimate of the payback time? How, how quickly will that pay itself back? I can pull that information. I don't have it in front of me. And actually, there's four assessments. And I think we've only done the first assessment. Okay. Um, so. Essentially, we have to look at payback times with each of them and see what do we want to bite off in the first year. Okay. So then, then my comment relative to that is if the payback time is short enough, it might very well make sense to actually borrow the money to do that work and, and repay that out of the, sa out of the monthly savings. Mm. Well, I don't think we would need to borrow... Um, well, we would, uh, I, I put it in budget for some significant repairs to the township um, office, and I don't anticipate exceeding that budget. But if I, you know, if we need to do that, yeah. uh, we, I think large, larger contracts come to this board before we yeah. uh, sign contracts. Or, or we can even do an amendment mm -hmm. to cover that, but it, it does seem as though that's something that the sooner it's done, mm -hmm. the better it'll be. Absolutely. Bill. Hey, you said that in the end we were um, had a net under budget. Do you mm -hmm. have an amount for how much under we were total? It was um, in the in the budget document that I provided. We had a end of year numbers. I can see if I can pull those up. But we were, you know, it was with. I think we were within about fifteen thousand dollars, twenty thousand okay. dollars under. Um, so we, you know, we're careful not to exceed the budget for this last year. Okay, thanks. Any other questions? Okay. Uh, all those. Uh, is this a roll call? Will the clerk please call the roll? Trustees Brown. Yes. <coughs> Hersey. Yes. Jacobson. Yes. Miller. Yes. Wu. Yes. That motion passes. Next up is resolution t 2019 r resolution allowing the supervisor to open accounts with PayPal and Network for Good for the purpose of collecting charitable donations for the township. So um, also uh, Wayne was texting me. He says he's on the phone, but he can't be heard. I guess he was trying to respond to your question. It wasn't able to be heard. So. Um, if there's a way to bring him on in terms of the tech, he could answer that question. In the meantime, I can uh, go forward with this particular resolution. So um, as you know, we uh, budgeted for and have opened uh, a angel, what we're calling the angel donor fund. Um, we had a number of groups and churches donate to the fund last year. 100% of that fund goes to directly to support the material needs for our participant. There's no admin fee, no Nothing goes to paper clips or staff. Um, we have been asked multiple times, is there a way that we can donate online to that fund? I've received um, both checks and cash. I really would prefer not to receive cash. Um, and um, although you know, we've been able to deposit things appropriately, I would prefer that there be an online donation space. Um, with our attorney's support, we've researched both PayPal and I also looked into Network for Good. Um, and essentially, as long as we set it up so that the money sweeps, uh, we, our preference is to have the money sweep that day into the bank account. So it's essentially a kind of transaction um, service more than it is a bank account. 
That said, because PayPal is a, it has a banking function mm -hmm. um, by statute, I'm required to come to you and ask um, to open up essentially bank collection um, spaces, both with PayPal and Network for Good, and that I'm still assessing if we're gonna use both or just one of those. And it can certainly let you know where you can make donations and where the public can make donations once we get that set up. Is there a motion? And then we'll have discussion. I'll move uh, approval of resolution number T-2019-08-016R, a resolution allowing the supervisor to open accounts with PayPal and Network for Good for the purpose of collecting charitable donations for the township. For approval. Second that. Moved by Jared, seconded by Eric. Any questions or comments? Bill. Is it, what's the administrative fee that PayPal or Network for Good charges, do you know? PayPal is terrible, and the smaller the donation, the bigger the fee, so it's actually not a percentage. It's like a, a certain, plus. yeah, it's a certain set amount, and then there's a percentage on top of that. That's why I wanted to look at Network for Good. Their um, percentages are much lower. Um, in fact, they're, I mean, with other charities I work with, I, we tend to try to work towards Network for Good. It's just the question of whether or not their functionality will work for us. Um, but I can certainly get that information, and I, that will basically be a primary reason as to whether or not we go with one or the other. Okay, so it'd still be good if, uh, if possible for people to write checks would be the better? Absolutely. Checks are always better because we don't have those fees, but, you know, honestly, there's a lot of the young people I know who don't know what a checkbook is. <laughs> um, and there are a lot of the people who are asking me if they can do it online. Yeah. Or swipe their Apple Pay or bring their phone in. And I'm like, sure, we'll take your money. I just have to work it out. And is there any way to do Apple Pay directly? With I can look into that. I mean, um, right now, I, I primarily been, people have asked, is there a way to link from the website? But I'm always looking for ways to save us on fees, so I will look into that. Okay, thanks. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? Okay, well, the, uh, all those in favor, please say there aye. There should be a roll call on both of these remaining ones. Roll call? Yes. Okay. Will the clerk please call the roll? Trustee Brown? Yes. Hersey? Yes. Jacobson? Yes. Miller? Yes. And Wu? Yes. That motion passes. Last resolution to consider is number T twenty nineteen zero eight zero one five R. Wayne Wayne is trying to get through. I don't know if we try again okay. here. Austin's trying to fix it. I don't know. Wayne. Wayne. I don't know if you're on mute, Wayne. He can hear us, but he can't seem to get through. That seems okay. Mm -hmm. Well, I think when he responds to the question, um, we will need to share it with the board so everyone on the board has the information from Wayne. So I'll, I can, I mean, I think he heard it, but in case I'll check in with him so that he can get okay. answered. Just board. make sure he sends it out uh -huh. to the whole board. Sure. Thank you. Tim? Okay, resolution 2019-08-015R, resolution regarding the release of closed session minutes for the period ending July 31st, 2019. And would the clerk walk us through this? This is the uh, twice a year resolution of uh, releasing certain minutes or holding others in confidence. The only thing that's appropriate to release at this time uh, is, a, uh, is the, review, the last joint meeting uh, review of closed minutes from last January. Uh, the last meeting we had is still in preparation and uh, there are a couple of uh, CDs that can be uh, destroyed per the state's uh, uh, rules on 18-month uh, retention of uh, voice recordings. So based on the Schedule A, B, C that is in front of the board, um, Schedule A is what they're voting on? Schedule A is uh, the minutes being released. Schedule B are those being held for co in, in confidence. And Schedule C are those that have been approved that also, they've been approved, written copies are, exist, but we are entitled to destroy the uh, voice recordings. Okay, this motion focuses on Schedule A. Is that correct? Yes, it, it, it Schedule A holds Schedule B confident, confidential and, and allows me to destroy the two okay, recordings. Okay, so it covers everything yeah, it covers on here. Covers everything, gotcha. yes. All right, just wanted to clarify. Is there a motion? 
Mary Alice. I'll move that we approve resolution number T 2019-08015-R. Second. Moved by Mary Alice, seconded by Bill. Any further discussion? Will the clerk please call the roll? Trustees Brown? Yes. Percy? Yes. Jacobson? Yes. Miller? Yes. And Wu? Yes. That motion passes. We'll give Wayne one last chance. Wayne, are you there? Okay. We'll get the information to the board. Yeah. Okay. With no further business before the town board, this meeting is adjourned. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, I would like to call this meeting of the Urbana City Council to order, Monday, August 5th, 2019. Will the clerk please call the roll? City Council Members Brown? Here. Hazen? Hersey? Here. Jacobson? Here. Miller? Here. Roberts? Wu? Here. Mayor Marley? Here. Next up is approval of minutes of the previous meetings, the July 15th joint meeting and the July 15th meeting. Is there a motion for approval? So moved. Second. Moved by Jared, seconded by Eric. Are there any corrections? Okay, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 All those opposed, same sign. That motion passes. Um, under additions to the agenda, I've had a request to move item four under new business to follow item one, and that's to accommodate a representative who's here from Indianapolis, and I'll give her a chance to get on the road a little bit sooner. Is there a motion for that? I'll move approval of moving the item. Second. Moved by Jarek, seconded by Sharice. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 All those opposed? Okay, so we'll move item four um, up to, to be the second item we consider under new business. Public input, I have cards from two um, individuals. Um, first is Eldress Melinda Carr. She wishes to express continued concerns about the Dr. Ellis subdivision sewer issues, equity, and historic input. And then we have a card from Reverend Dr. Evelyn and Bishop King James Underwood regarding the Dr. Ellis subdivision sewer concerns. They are continuously concerned about the Dr. Ellis subdivision sewer problems. Does anyone else wish to address the Urbana City Council? You'll need to fill out a green sheet. Okay. All right. We have one presentation scheduled tonight, and that's an update on UC2B. So come on up. Yeah, it's under public input. 
So Mike Smeltzer is here, and will anyone else be speaking tonight? Will anyone else be speaking tonight? Um, Paul Hickson is here, who's okay. one of your appointees to the UCDB board. Mm -hmm. And Brian Olson is here. He's the general manager for uh, I3. Okay. You may have some questions for him or okay. for Paul uh, after I'm through. But so you've got the expert panel here. I, okay, I, I, great. I brought wingmen. Well, thanks for having me. Um, I was contemplating having a little more time than what you'd like me to have, so I'm gonna go fast, and you may see some things on the slides that I don't address stereo um, as much as I might otherwise. I will provide you with my written comments because they're all complete English sentences and you can read them, well, mostly complete. Um, the very short version is that we are 10 years into this project. Uh, I know that seems impossible, but it's true. Um, federal and state grants paid for most of it, which is good. Uh, we built what we said we would build, and it works. And it works the way we said it would work, which is always nice. Uh, through private funding and partnerships, uh, the UCDB fiber network has continued to grow. And as we look to the future, uh, the UCDB not-for-profit will remain focused on expanding the fiber connectivity to all of Urbana and Champaign and on enabling everyone in our community to take advantage of this fiber infrastructure. However, that may not be possible to do that with just volunteers. We're close to the edge of what an all-volunteer organization can get accomplished, but we can talk about that some other time. Uh, some real quick history. Uh, some of you were not involved in the city council at all when this got started, um, and actually back in the 90s, Larry Smarr from NCSA got the ball rolling. Um, he said, hey, this thing called the Internet's coming. You guys ought to do something about it. Uh, the Chamber of Commerce got involved, did some things about it. Uh, in 1997, I sat right here and tried to convince the Urbana City Council to adopt something called CUNet 2000. Um, silly me thought it would only take three years to build a community fiber network at that point, and that was where the name came from. Uh, that didn't work out so well. We had a nice map. Uh, we had different networks. Um, we had CopNet, we had GovNet, we had EduNet, we had MedNet, BankNet, and BizNet, and Skynet was one of our original sponsors. <laughs> um, back then, there was something called the Champaign-Urbana Cable Commission, uh, and they had a subcommittee called the Broadband Access Committee. Um, Danielle was a participant in that. I guess she's taken off, but, um, and their goal, their charge was to figure out how to improve broadband in this community. Um, around that same time, I was involved in that because I was at the university as the director of networking. Um, around that same time, Educause, which is kind of a consortium of major research institutions, um, had a white paper and they basically said, hey, it'll take $200 billion to do it, but we ought to wire up every home and business in the country and just call it over. Um, at the time, they thought that we should um, pay for it, or it should be paid for with the federal government, state governments, and local governments doing a three-way split of that $200 billion. Um, I heard that, I brought that back to the back committee, and they said, well, that's interesting, but we'll never get any money from Springfield, we'll never get any money from Washington, let's split it with the two cities and the university. That's a three-way split. Uh, and so we were kind of talking about that. Um, and then the, the election happened in 2008. Um, and it turns out that one of the people who had read that white paper was Barack Obama. And so he put money into the stimulus legislation uh, specifically for broadband. Uh, we found out about that and did some research. Um, I attended some meetings and we hired a consultant. And on the day that Barack Obama signed that legislation the, authorizing the all the recovery money, but also the broadband money, uh, Joanne Hovis was here at the I Hotel speaking to about 150 people about what we could do to take advantage of that once it became available. Um, one of the catches of that was that it required a 20% local match, and that was kind of a challenge because we were talking about some big money, and 20% of big money is still big money. Um, at the same time, the state of Illinois came out with a matching program. Um, Pat Quinn was in very much a broadband supporter. And they put some money up that we could use as 10 per a half of our local match. So instead of having to raise 20%, we only had to raise 10% if we got the state support. We had to do a whole presentation to them and, and get approved. Um, 
To make this all happen, Urbana, Champaign, and the university formed an intergovernmental consortium. Uh, basically, we took the um, funding doc founding documents for MedCAD and put in UC to be wherever MedCAD used to be and changed a few words, and that became UC to be. Um, and there was a very specific purpose for it. It was to get these grants and then to administer them and make it happen. Uh, the university was always going to be involved in managing the grants because that's something the university does very well. Uh, the Cham Senate, Champaign and Urbana were involved in administering the construction um, and then maybe doing the operations for uh, the resulting network. Uh, we won two grants, one for $22 million from the federal government, one for $3.5 million from the state government, and we raised $3.4 million in local matching funds. Uh, some of that was from the cities of Urbana and Champaign. Some of that was from the University of Illinois, the Mass Transit District, the Illinois Century Network, uh, a regional network called Serban that's based out of Bloomington, Champaign Telephone Company, which is now Consolidated Communications, they were one of the contributors, and a company called Peg Bandwidth, which has now been owned by Windstream, that provides connectivity to cell towers. They all, all those organizations prepaid for long-term leases of fiber. Uh, because they all had reasons to have fiber and they needed to connect various things to each other. Um, we hired contractors, got started, we had a big groundbreaking. Uh, some of you can find yourself in this picture. Um, I see some people looking. I'm even in that picture. I was able to get uh, Daryl Holman from the News Gazette to take it for us. Um, we built grant funded infrastructure and we had really two halves of the project. Half of it was building rings throughout the city, which I'll spend some time talking about. But the other half was doing fiber to the premise, or fiber to the home, as people like to call it. And that happened in 11 primarily low-income neighborhoods. Um, we did that after doing a door-to-door -door survey that was administered by none other than Mary Alice Wu um, and her role at the university, and found out that we had a series of neighborhoods that had less than a 41% adoption rate, rate of broadband at that time. That was the federal government's cutoff for funding for fiber to the home. Um, so we did fiber to the home in those areas, and we also built the rings, which allowed us to provide services to 256 anchor institutions. Um, and we'll talk about anchor institutions a little bit more. Um, why did we do fiber to the premise? Uh, there's wireless, there's other solutions that are out there. 10 years ago, 20 years ago, and today, fiber remains the only technology that's gonna be with us. Our, our children and our grandchildren are gonna benefit from the fiber we put in the ground eight years ago. Uh, it lasts that long. They'll put different electronics on the ends of it over time, but the fiber itself is gonna be useful for a very long time. The cities own the right of way, and that's where the fiber is. So we didn't have to get a license from anybody to use broadcast or anything. We didn't have to build any towers. We didn't have to attach anything to telephone poles. It's all in the right of ways, and it's all fairly simple as those things go. Um, Real quick, this is what the rings look like on paper. They don't come out looking nice and pretty like this. Uh, but there were basically three rings that are predominantly in Urbana. There were four rings that are predominantly in Champaign. All of the rings come back to two different nodes on the university campus. Um, and then there's routers at those nodes. Those routers talk to each other. So there's the opportunity to, for each of these anchor institutions, for this building, for you know a fire station, to have dual connections to the network. So if there's a fiber cut on one side of the ring, you don't care because the other side of the ring kicks in and just keeps on working. Some of the network that City of Urbana had built prior to this, it didn't have dual connections. It had a single connection. And depending on where the fiber got cut, you could lose half your school district. Uh, and it might take a day to get it fixed, which is not real convenient for anyone. Um, we did fiber to the premise, and this doesn't show up really well, the rings, the fiber of the premise zones are yellow on that map. They should look better on that screen than they do on this one. Um, and you know your way around town, and they are primarily in low-income areas, although they weren't chosen because they were low-income areas. They were chosen because they had less than 41% broadband adoption. There's a strong correlation between income and broadband adoption, so that didn't surprise anybody. We had 256 anchor institutions. That's a lot of anchor institutions for a community this size. We changed the federal government's definition of an anchor institution. They said you could have schools, you could have medical facilities, you could have libraries, you could have public safety buildings. Um, and then they had an other category. They didn't define what other was, 
So we said, okay, other. What did Congress say we should be doing with the money? Congress said we should be using this money to serve vulnerable populations. Well, what's a vulnerable population? Really old people are kind of vulnerable. Really young people. People who are disabled. People who are homeless. People who may have emotional or mental issues. And we have an awful lot of agencies in this community that work with all those broad groups of people. Um, and those people got fiber connections. Uh, and that was, we were unique. Of all the projects that were funded in the entire country, um, we have an awful high density of uh, anchor institutions in a fairly small area. You can't see this list, but you'll get a copy of this. And this is the old one, but there they all are. And when you look at it, you'll see that an awful lot of agencies you might expect, Crisis Nursery, um, the uh, Urbana Connection Center, a neighbor, you know. <coughs> um, a lot of people looked at me 10 years ago when I sat here and said I, said I was fairly crazy, and they were right. Uh, but they weren't right that I was crazy about this because we built it and people are using it and they're doing good things with it. It was kind of, if you build it, they'll come. Well, if you build it, they'll use it. And people are using it, and it's only going to get better over time. Uh, that's a four. Oh, Charlie's in there. How about that? Uh, this is the ribbon cutting when we had our very first anchor institution ready to go. Um, I see some people I recognize. There's Carol, uh, former mayors, current mayors, uh, lots of different people. Um, Around the same time that, well, I'm getting a little out of order here, but um, there came a time when the city of Champaign decided that they did not want to operate the network. Um, if you think about the culture of both Urbana and Champaign, we don't do utilities. We don't do garbage, we don't do electricity, we don't do water, we kind of do sewer, but not really. Uh, and so doing broadband kind of run, there was some support for it, but it really wasn't gonna flow. So we were, the, the Intergovernmental Consortium pretty much said, well, you need to find a private partner to do the operational stuff day to day because the city of Champaign doesn't want to do it anymore. Um, so we formed a not-for-profit corporation um, and it looks a lot like what the old Intergovernmental Consortium used to be in that the cities and the university appoint people to it and it runs things and manages it. Uh, the city's current appointments are Paul Hickson, who's here tonight, uh, Landy Najaro and Jason Berg uh, are your other two. Uh, some past council members have been on the, uh, on the board, uh, Brandon Bowersox, Carol Ammons, and Charlie. Um, and some, a lot of you know Pete Resnick. He was around for a long time um, on the board. We found a private partner in 2014 uh, called ITV3. Uh, they were owned by the same people that own Family Video. Um, good folks, uh, they came in here guns blazing, did some things in the first year or two, and then kind of decided they want to be acquired, and the construction kind of slowed down. Um, they were acquired. We had some fairly complicated contracts that were involved, um, and it took a while, and we lost some construction years doing that. Uh, but now I3 Broadband has bought all the assets of ITV3. Uh, Brian was with ITV3, now he's with I3. Uh, they, you didn't have to repaint the trucks quite so much. Um, and you can see on this map uh, quickly what the whole, the yellow areas or the oranges areas are what the grant paid to build in terms of fiber to the home. The blue areas are what was built by ITV3 and I3, and I think I've got, yes, this is really just the Urbana sections and gives you a little better idea of what it looks like in Urbana. There's a lot of Urbana that now has, either through the grant or through what I3 has done, that has fiber to the home. Uh, and that's good. Um, why did Urbana invest 10 years ago in this project? Uh, you had some fiber, uh, but you didn't have everything connected. The North Fire Station wasn't connected to fiber. Uh, King School was not connected to any of the other schools. You didn't have redundant connections for any of the buildings on here. And there was also some concern about what's going to happen with Olympia Drive and High Cross Road in terms of connectivity going forward. Uh, there was some discussion about maybe a fire station way out north or way out east. And it would be nice to have fiber available to serve that when the time came. Um, MedCAD um, was one of our investors. And, and when we look at 
some of the ways that uh, other organizations have benefited from this, they now have a remote operations center over in Champaign. Well, you may not like the fact that it's in Champaign, but it needs to be in Champaign. It needs to be as far away from the one here as it can be, but still um, be on the same fiber network uh, because you don't want it to be on the same part of the power grid. You don't want it to be on the same part of the telephone grid. If something really bad happens in East Urbana, you don't want to lose 911 for the county, and having it being in Champaign gets that done. Having fiber make it happen, it might as well be next door because it happens that quickly. Um, any of you use Siri or Alexa? Uh, a lot of times when you ask Siri or Alexa questions, you're talking to UC to be fiber because Wolfram Research is providing the answers to those questions and they're connected to the world over UC to be fiber. A little known fact. Uh, sanitary District and MTD both are using the fiber. Um, I never thought the Sanitary District would be a big customer, but as it turns out, it, they have pumping stations throughout the community. They have treatment plants. It's a bad thing when the pumping stations and the treatment plants get out of sync with each other. I'll leave that to your imagination. Um, they used to connect this with phone wires and sometimes with little cell phones and things, and it didn't always work real well. Uh, Sanitary District put in fiber into nine of their highest volume pumping stations, and they don't have those kinds of issues anymore. I think they're actually looking at doing some additional locations. Uh, the Mass Transit District did some, or was planning on doing some interesting things, and they're continuing doing that. They bought fiber throughout the community. Uh, when you're in a bus shelter, it's kind of nice to be able to figure out when the next bus is coming by, or if you're not familiar with the community, if you're sitting here and you want to go there, to be able to figure out what that route's going to be. They have interactive terminals to do that. Those terminals need to talk back to the servers. Fiber helps that happen. Probably more importantly for a lot of people, they have video monitoring a lot of the shelters now. Uh, if you're sitting there late at night, it's nice to know someone's watching you, and uh, hopefully that will deter bad people. Uh, the biggest change for Champaign-Urbana, um, and especially Urbana, actually, has been the competition. A lot of you have UC2B fiber now, but many of you don't. And even if you don't, there's competition now. And there are places in Urbana that have three different fiber-to-the-home providers. There are communities in this country that would kill to have one provider, and Urbana's got three. What's that do to price? It keeps the prices low. What's that do to service? Hopefully it keeps the service levels high. It's been a long time since AT&T or Comcast has raised their rates on things around here. There's a reason for that. There's competition now. If you're a business in Champaign-Urbana, you have seven different options for fiber providers. Some of those are uc to b based, um, and some of those are just companies that didn't get involved with uc to b until it was too late to get involved, and they went out and built their own fiber. <coughs> or some companies like Comcast and AT&T, they always build their own fiber. Uh, but you have a lot of choices as a business, um, and <coughs> anyone who's on uc to b fiber can get multiple providers over that fiber. So competition has happened in a big way in the business community, and it's happened in a, certainly in a big way, much more in Urbana than Champaign at this point, uh, in terms of fiber to the home. Um, back in 2009 when we were funded, there were things that we asked for that were not funded, and that's really a lot of the focus of UC to be these days. Uh, we had two different proposals um, to do digital equity things, training, helping people learn how to use computers, how to use the network, educational purposes, vocational purposes, job training, you name it. Um, neither of those proposals were funded, but the needs didn't go away just because we didn't get the money. So <coughs> UC2B tried to do some things in order to leverage what we did have money for, and one of those ways was doing all the anchor institutions. Because if we got all those places connected, that opened the door for connecting more things, and that happened doing the fiber to the home, we were only one of two projects in the entire country that tried to do fiber to the home. We were pretty unique in that. It was a big challenge, um, and it, it was a challenge. <laughs> and I used to have darker hair. Um, but nonetheless, we did that, and the areas <coughs> that we did would have been the last areas that an incumbent provider would have done. They would have chased the money. They wouldn't have built in these areas because these are not high-income areas. Uh, and we did those areas first, so we're, we got, them done, got those ones done with the grant money. Again, that is going to hopefully make a difference to the lives of some of the people who live in those areas. 
Um, we created something called the Community Benefit Fund. Um, we gave out awards starting uh, last year, actually. Paul Hickson was running the Community Benefit Fund, and this is a list of the award winners last year. Um, my favorite last year was the Urbana Neighborhood Connection Center. Uh, Janice was just getting that started back in 2009 when we did this, um, but I'd heard about it and people were talking it up, so we made sure that the Urbana Neighborhood Connection Center got connected. There's fiber that runs right by them, and it may not have run right by them had she not been there. Um, they didn't use it right away, but now they're using it and they're kind of liking it. Um, but we have this uh, recurring program. We have regular donations every year for another five or so years, I believe. Um, maybe not quite that many. Uh, from I3, that was built into our contracts. We're in the process of becoming, uh, having a subsidiary that's a 501c3, so that if you wanted to, you could give a tax deductible donation to the community benefit fund. Because we, we gave out eight awards, but these were not big chunks of money. They helped these organizations. We could have helped them a lot more if we had more money. And the money we gave out last year was actually several years worth of donations that we had gotten initially. So the community benefit fund is really gonna be a lot of the focus of UCDB going forward. Um, if we look towards the future, um, I3 Broadband is going to continue to operate the network and continue to expand the areas that get fiber to the home. Our agreement with them laid out a kind of a plan that said in the next six years you need to pass 22,000 single family homes. They're determining which, which homes they go by. Um, our math at the time said if they went by 22,000 more homes than they were already by, that was going to be pretty much a lot of the community. Uh, we have an awful lot of apartments and things that aren't single family homes, and a lot of those apartments are already taken care of when it comes to internet, but single family homes weren't. Um, so they're going to continue to do their thing, and they're, I think we're three years into that agreement, and the first two years they did the number of homes they were required to do, and they're well on their way to doing them this year. Um, the UCDB NFP will continue to advise I3 Broadband. We meet out at their place once a month. Uh, we'll continue to administer the Community Benefit Fund, and we'll continue uh, seeking additional funding for the Community Benefit Fund from other sources. Um, there are foundations and organizations that look at digital equity as being an issue that they like to fund. And I think we've got a good story to tell, and we're going to continue to do that. Um, the Intergovernmental Consortium still exists. Um, it, the members appoint the current UCDB board. Uh, each um, agency appoints three people. Um, and there are probably our big question going forward is, will we get to a point where the consortium perhaps has a general manager that is funded somehow? Um, we have hit some roadblocks over the last year um, just because we, we are a total volunteer organization and we've had some people who have had personal issues that have taken them away and we just, we're not very deep. Uh, so some things that we'd like to have gotten done in the last year haven't gotten done, uh, not because people weren't willing to do the work, they just couldn't do the work for one reason or another. Uh, and it may be a general manager is something that we will come back and talk about at some point in the future. It's a, an idea that's percolating. Those were none of my prepared remarks, but just reading to my slides, and I, I don't know how long I went, but that's it. I think it. we'll take questions now. <laughs> Wonderful, and I, I, I hope these guys will help me answer if necessary. Thank you, Mike. Bill. Yeah, I was trying to remember how the Community Benefit Fund is, is funded now. It, when the I3 sale went through, it seemed like there was some continuation of a percentage or a dollar amount every year. Is that still going? Is that uh, yes, that's going that. indefinitely, or is there is there an expiration time for that? Not I think, indefinitely. I think um, Paul wants to answer that question. Yeah, he, he's the guy. Yes, uh, the agreement with I3, and they have done a marvelous job both of building out and of helping keep this uh, community benefit fund going, but that obligation ends at the end of December of 2022. So three and a half more years of monthly payments, and that, um, that disappears, and that's $50,000 per year. 
Okay, thanks. Any other questions? Sharice? So, <clears throat> and I'm asking this, of course, because my mom has I, <laughs> IV3, I3BB. Um, so you're saying in three years, what, it'll be privatized or what's going to? The, I'm trying to understand. I, okay. I wasn't here when any of this. Right. So UC to be mm -hmm. is the organization that basically got the grant. Mm -hmm. And as Mike was explaining, uh, Ms. Hersey, that after a decision was made by all three parties, mm -hmm. the university, City of Champaign, and City of Urbana, that none of those parties wanted to run an internet service provider. Mm -hmm. They didn't want to be an ISP. Right. Then we had to go find a private partner. Okay, so The ITV. first partner we found was ITV3. Okay. And then that company was sold, and it, now our new private partner is I3. Mm -hmm. A condition of the sale of us giving them the rights to use the fiber that we'd gotten through the grant mm -hmm. was that for a time period they had to contribute to this community development fund. Okay. Community benefit fund. And those terms changed a little bit between our agreement with ITV3 and our agreement with I3 Broadband. Mm -hmm. I3 has been the most generous, but that time period from the time it was originally agreed to to the end was six and a half years. Mm -hmm. It took place over seven budget years. And at, at the end of that time, um, they are no longer on, under an obligation to help fund the Community Benefit Fund. Um, they will continue to manage the private network. Mm -hmm. So, um, and, and the IRU, the Indefeasible Right of Use, is actually owned by UC2B. Yeah. The, uh, the fiber is on a 20-year lease. Okay. Um, I, I mentioned before there were private companies like the city of Urbana, for instance, has strands of fiber on all those three rings that are in Urbana and also actually one of the rings that are in Champaign. Mm -hmm. um, why would you want fiber in Champaign? Well, the library wanted to get to the Heartland Library office up in North Champaign because when you check out a book from the library here, it had to talk to a server that was in North Champaign. In Douglas Branch. Work. Yeah. Uh -huh. um, but those are all 20-year leases, and those 20-year leases started in 2014, I want to say. Mm -hmm. uh, so they go on for quite some time. And we have a, the, the, the not-for-profit has a a 20-year lease for like 80% of the fiber with I3. Mm -hmm. And they're, uh, they're using that fiber under the terms of that lease. And the terms of that lease were that they were going to build and invest a lot of money in this, net, in, in this network, as well as provide money to the, the community benefit fund. And they also provide a small amount of money for just our, the operations of the NFP. Mm -hmm. I mean, we have attorneys and you know, all the same things everybody has, but we have attorneys and accountants and whatnot, and we, we have to pay them somehow. Mm -hmm. um, so that's not necessarily going to change um, in terms of who's running the network or how it's privatized. Nothing's really changing that. It's just the funding for the Community Benefit Fund is most likely going to change uh, at the end of 2022. Yes. Now, it's possible, and I'm not trying to put any pressure on it, it's possible that I3 may say, okay, we'll, we'll do this for longer than that. Mm -hmm. But it's also possible they'll say, oh, that was our commitment, and we'll, we'll do that, and that's that. So between now and then, and we've got some time, obviously, we're trying to position ourselves to be able to go to the, the, the Gates Foundation and say, hey, look what we're doing in the community. We're helping people learn how to use technology and so forth. We'd like $50,000 from you, or we'd like $500,000 from you, whatever. Oh, a million. <laughs> don't, don't ask small, I guess. <laughs> that's uh, right. So that's it. There's no, nothing really bad happening at, at the end of 2022 other than their contractual obligation to de donate to the Community Benefit Fund ends. Okay, so, so how, th how will this, they're not contributing to the, C the CBF, will that um, affect the cost, the bill that they get 
from I3 TV or anything? I wouldn't no. think so. Um, because I know there are a lot of people in. No, no relationship. No relationship at all. Okay. So the, but the I the IBF. My question, I guess, is to the IBF helps to um, the helps to connect the fiber to particular institutions, or it it hasn't. There have been people who have approached us recently and said maybe that would be a good use of it. Mm -hmm. um, that either subsidizing people's connections. Um, I'm pretty sure if 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 you live, well, you've got you've got fiber. Yeah. Um, you didn't pay a, a fee to get connected, did you? No, I did not. Okay, so they don't charge to, there's no charge to get connected to, as long as it's already in your front yard. And what I3 is committed to do, or contractually obligated to do, is to put fiber in front of people's homes, and they're, they're committed to do 3,500 of those private, or single family residences, build it in the front yard. Mm -hmm. And it's their policy not to charge every year, it's every year for the next several years. So that's going to grow. These areas of the map that were blue, you're going to see more blue. Okay. Um, and there will be more blue by the end of this year. Uh, they don't telegraph what they're doing because their competitors sometimes do weird competitive things if they know where they're going to go next. Uh, so no, it shouldn't have any effect on that. Uh, okay. I, I would say the only thing that I, and this is for future discussion, but as I look at the university, as I look at the city of Urbana and I look at the city of Champaign, all three entities have some interest and some resources that are put toward the issue of how to help underserved members of the community use technology to improve their lives. Digital literacy, uh, education, um, youth at risk, elderly population and my suggestion is that at some future date we all think collectively together about whether or not uh, there might be some advantage in the, the original three parties doing a more integrated way of planning together to address those needs. Okay. Okay, thank you. Eric. Um, two questions. Uh, one, is fiber essentially immortal? Once it's in the ground, it will last as long as we will anyway? Unfortunately, no. Um, Freeze-thaw cycles have a, a bad effect on fiber. Um, it gradually gets cloudy. The more mm -hmm. times you f freeze it and thaw it, freeze it and thaw it, uh, at least the older fiber. Uh, there's some fiber that's in use today that's 30 years old. Uh, typically, um, IRUs were done for 20 years because when fiber was first put in the ground back in the late 80s, um, Corning and the companies that made it thought it would last for 20 years. They've, they keep improving it and doing different ways of making the glass. Um, nobody really knows exactly how long it's going to last because you can't anticipate that. But the fiber that's in the ground here, it's all in conduits. If the, the fiber that's going down High Cross Road were, let's say it got cloudy overnight and stopped transmitting light, you open up one end of the conduit and you open the other end of the conduit, you pull out the old fiber and you pull in a new one. You don't have to dig up anything. There's manholes there. It was all done knowing that it might even grow. You know, we someday may run out of strands. Let's say Urbana grows, grows like crazy going east and somehow you get 20,000 new homes over there. Well, we don't have enough fiber to accommodate 20,000 new homes. But in that same conduit that has a, a cable that has 216 strands, you can put a cable that has 532 strands. Um, and it, it's, the strands are so small that the cables don't get much bigger um, when you do that. And so it's, it's upgradable if it needs to be. So the maintenance costs of keeping up the existing fiber network are very, very low. It's a very tiny fraction of the The what biggest we're cost about. Um, is actually Julie. Um, anytime you go to plant a tree or the city puts in a new curb, you know, you call Julie to see what's underground. Well, I3 now has an account that works with Julie. Uh, you guys do your own locates, don't you? Correct. They, they do their own, but a lot of them use a company, I'm not thinking of their name. Hmm? 
USIC. USIC, thank you. Um, AT&T and Comcast use it for the same company that goes out and does that and puts little flags in your yard and so forth. That costs them, well, they do it in bulk, but it's probably about $10 a visit per utility. Mm -hmm. um, and when UCDB was an ongoing operation that the city of Champaign was managing, the bill from Julie every month was the single biggest expense just mm -hmm. to protect that asset that's in the ground. Okay. Um, and we've been really, I won't say lucky, but we've been fairly fortunate. There are close to 200 miles of fiber throughout Champaign-Urbana, and there have been very few fiber cuts. Okay. Now, I, I had to say that, didn't I? Um, I'm sorry, I didn't mean it. <laughs> um, so my, my second question is, do we know what fraction of residential units in Urbana still do not have fiber to the unit? No, we don't. Um, Champagne, I'm, I'm doing one of these upgrade, uh, updates for Champagne. Um, Champagne has a slightly, I'm going to say, more granular uh, GIS system than Urbana does. You're all part of the county system, but the data that you put into it in mm -hmm. terms of what the buildings are and the building shapes and all that. In Champaign, when you look at, when you go on to the county site, you can actually see the outline of all the buildings that are in Champaign. I don't think you have that mm. in Urbana quite the same way. Wow. Um, and I don't know that you have the same granularity of which is a duplex, which is just triplex, which is a fourplex. Mm -hmm. This is an MDU building that's got 32 units and whatnot. Um, that's a really hard, I wish I could tell you that number, but it's a really hard number to come up with. Um, Mark Tolson, who is the IT manager for Champaign, who used to be the GIS coordinator for the county, he's working on trying to produce that number for Champaign. He, he was actually asked to do it for both Urbana and Champaign, but he's not sure that the data exists for Urbana. And it's, it's a big collection, it's a big investment of somebody's time to generate that data in the first place. Um, and I don't think Urbana has invested in that at this point. It, it's a standard, uh, I already <laughs> asked this, is it standard procedure now for when a significantly large uh, development goes in for a, n a new development for fiber adequate to bring it to all the units goes in automatically, like um, the ones that are that are going up here in Urbana this year and next year? Um, no, we tried that with the housing authority. There mm -hmm. is a, there was a new uh, complex just immediately to the east of um, the STEM Academy that's actually in Champaign. It's, it's right on, on either side of Wright Street. Um, about, um, Booker T. Washington School? Right. Yeah. The, there's a, there was a new uh, housing authority complex that was built right to the east of that. Yeah. And we worked very closely that's with them. Page. This was back during the grant. And, and we put fiber to each building and then we did ethernet cabling within each building so each, each unit had, I think, a, a fiber outlet in the living room, the one in the bedroom, and maybe one in the kitchen. Um, and some people took advantage of it, some people didn't. Some of the contractors didn't like, you know, these were, these were union contractors from someplace else other than here that were doing the work in some cases, and they didn't like this other thing going on at the same time. And so, I mean, we've, we've had a number of, of new developments come in front of us and like right north of here on Vine Street, and mm -hmm. the Gather Project, which is gonna be going up next year and so forth. And, the, and so we, they're not sort of automatically bringing in fiber adequate for all the units. They're not necessarily, but there are things that uh, developers can do to make it easy. Mm -hmm. And it's maybe just as simple as designing a telecommunications room in the basement and putting conduit from that telecommunications room okay. out to a manhole out at the curb. I mean, I3 would love to, I'm sure, work with any developer uh, okay. because Brian knows it, he doesn't know off the top of his head, but chances are there's already fiber very, very close to those two developments you're talking about. And it's just a matter of how, how do you get it into the building is one of the biggest challenges, especially with a big building. Mm -hmm. And if you plan for it ahead of time and, and when you're pouring concrete and you just put a conduit in and bring it out to the street, that makes it easy for everybody. So I have to say that as we were, as these developments were coming before us, I certainly was not being mindful of that issue, and I, I will be in the future. And it's, it's, it's an easy thing to ask them. 
if, if, I, if I were king for a day and I'm running Urbana, I, I would require it. Mm -hmm. You know, that you, you do multiple conduits, you, and not just for I3. You know, you want to you make it easy for AT&T, for God's sakes. You want to make it easy for Comcast or Volo or whoever, whoever may want to provide services there. Uh, running some conduits out to the street and don't making technology and communications an afterthought is just good business. We can look in to see what, what the situation with that is. Yeah, I mean, it, it, it seems to me it's in their interest as, as a marketing thing. If yeah. Every uh, unit has I would think the market fiber. would dictate the fiber to that building, to those I buildings would in particular. I think so, but probably <laughs> should check. We'll check. We have time for one more question or comment. Uh, Yes. Okay, so Eric stole my com my question, so I'll just make one comment. So I worked on this original grant back in 2009. We did the it grant. Was. Uh, it was. July, it was the craziest time of my life working on this grant. Yep. Um, I, I would like to just say we finally got fiber to our home last year after 10 years of working and waiting for that fiber. <laughs> we lived in the donut hole, so yep. I'm very happy to have it now. And Brian was instrumental in filling the donut hole. So, <laughs> thank Brian. Well, thank, and, you. thank you. And I would, I would like to thank you both and Brian as well for your dedication and vision and persistence over the years. I came on the council in 2009 in May, and you've been at it ever since. So. We have. Anyway, yeah. thank you very much. Well, thank you. I will, Charlie, I will make this a little more easy to reproduce and send them to you. Yes because you really got the Cliff Notes version here. <laughs> Thanks. Thank you. Thank you for limiting it to Cliff Notes. <laughs> well, there were, there okay. were some good jokes in the regular version. But. <laughs> uh, on finished business, we have none. Are there reports of standing committees? Reports of special committees? Reports of officers? All right, we'll move on to new business. First up is Ordinance 2019-08-039, Ordinance Approving Major Variances, 802 North Goodwin Avenue. Lily Wilcox, planner extraordinaire, will be presenting. <laughs> Good evening. Getting ahead of myself. So, for tonight, uh, there is 802 North Goodwin Avenue. Um, the applicant is, it's pretty hot, here, here. Uh, Gustavo Batista um, of 802 North Goodwin Avenue. He bought the, the property this spring. Uh, he has applied for a conditional use permit, which was granted July 17th, 2019, at the Zoning Board of Appeals meeting. Um, with that conditional use permit, um, on, tried on the same night, was a two variances in order to use the existing parking lot uh, on the property. The property, one variance would be to allow parking in the front yard on the B1 property. There's two front yards that face uh, Hill and Goodwin Avenue, Hill Street, and the other variance is to allow three parking spaces um, to be provided rather than the four parking spaces that's required in our parking requirements table in Article 8, Parking and Access. Uh, Zoning Board of Appeals voted unanimously to recommend approval from, for City Council on July 17th. Uh, there was a, a very robust public input uh, portion of the meeting. Um, it was collected for and against the case. There were 24 letters of support that were collected um, for, in support of the case from Mr. Bautista. There were 12 signatures that were collected against the case from Mr. Mosley. Um, I'm going to go through and show a little bit about the property. Um, so here you can see the property. Um, this is commercial land use. Um, this is a parking lot for the elementary school that's to the north, King Elementary. Um, you have a single family home that is no longer rented, despite what the land use code from the tax assessor's office says. A uh, single family home single family home and duplex. Um, and then lastly, I want to share, this one doesn't sound like it's on.
the proposed site plan, which is uh, right here. We've got the existing building, um, fence storage area, and then you've got a solid six foot, foot fence on both sides except right here when it's closest to uh, the Hill Street side, which would be 50% four foot fence. This is all outlined in our zoning ordinance and it's required when you establish a use um, on a B1 property. For the parking, it was very tricky. This property is the size of a residential um, lot, which is kind of for the, the character of a B1 zoning district. Um, you have three accessible parking spots right here, which will allow for a one-way access aisle. Um, so that took a lot of tricky maneuvering. Um, there are quite, there are some other, very few other ways to, to handle that situation, but um, most of them would end up at, you know, providing other kind of complications. So. Um, and really quickly, I'm going to go through a couple of the staff findings. Uh, does it sound like this mic is on? It, yeah. Closer. Hello. Oh, okay. All right. Sorry. Thank you. Uh, staff findings. Uh, number one, Gustavo Batista was granted a conditional use permit by the ZBA to allow a contractor shop with a showroom at 802 North Goodwin Avenue in the R3 single and two family residential zoning district. Um, and I, uh, it's, let's change that really fast to R1. Um, neighborhood business zoning district. Number two, Mr. Bautista has also requested a major variance to reduce the amount of parking required from four to three spaces and a major variance to allow car parking in the required front yard. Number three, the variances will allow the existing building and existing concrete pad to be used. Number four, the variance request will not serve as a special privilege to the property owner if granted, as there are special circumstances relating to the land, such as location of the existing building and parking lot, and the size of the lot. Number five, the property owner did not deliberately create this situation, as the building has been in this location for decades, and the owner just recently purchased the property. Number six, the variances will not alter the essential character of the neighborhood as vehicles have routinely parked there on the existing pavement. Number seven, the variances will not create a nuisance as this use will be much, a much lower intensity use than the previous gas station and will renovate and reuse a building rather than encourage it to fall into disrepair if it remains vacant. And number eight, the variances represent a minimum deviation from the zoning ordinance as only three parking spaces are needed for the business uh, and are replicating historic par parking patterns on the site. Um, the city council has options. Um, city council uh, has the following options. Number one, approve the variance. Two, approve the ordinance, approve the ordinance variance, um, variance for an, well, you guys get it. Number two, approve the ordinance with certain terms and conditions, and if so, articulate all, all terms, conditions, and findings. And number three, deny the ordinance. Uh, recommendation, at its July 17th, 2019 meeting, the ZBA voted six A's and zero nays to forward the major variance to city council with the recommendation to approve the request. Um, city staff likewise recommends approval. A motion and then we'll discuss. I'll move approval of the staff recommendation to uh, to approve this ordinance. I'll second. Uh, ordinance number 2019-08039 moved approval by Eric, seconded by Jared. Are there technical questions for Lily? Mary Alice. So I just wanted to clarify um, in your presentation you said that there were 24 people who sorry, 21 people in support from the neighborhood and 12 that were not in support. Um, but then in the exhibit, it's mentioned that there's uh, no statement in terms of the intent of the position for the 12 signatures. So we don't know if those 12 people were in support or not in support. Is that correct? That is, yes, that is very true. Um, and there, one thing to note for that list of people and signatures, that was presented to ZBA as against the case. Um, one of those people showed up to talk to ZBA about the case and stated that they were neither for nor against the case during that. So 
Did they um, say why they signed a piece of blank paper? Right. Uh, I'm just curious if they, they gave any insight into why they signed that. That question wasn't really, uh, that wasn't forwardly asked like that. Um, but it, she did mention what she was there to discuss, which was the, when the property was vacant for many, many years, many people in the neighborhood had used that, that parking surface as a parking lot just for uh, auxiliary sure. storage from their house. Um, and one day when, when Gus Batista took prop ownership of that property, he put notices on people's cars saying, please don't park here, you know, liability stuff. And um, she wanted more of a notice to that. I will say, uh, when Gus Batista bought the property and came to the city of Urbana and mentioned what he wanted to do with it, we knew that they were going to need a conditional use permit, and we asked him very politely not to put up signs or start running a business out of that property before he gets the proper approvals. So that might also be something that we'd, we'd kind of set up saying, you know, no signs, and, and when she would really appreciate a sign. Gotcha. Yeah. Okay. Thank you for that clarification. Any other okay. questions? Sharice? Sh yeah. So, so I know that the, uh, this piece of property used to be a gas station slash candy store slash hangout <laughs> on some levels. Um, I'm not understanding exactly what Mr. Bautista is. What, what, what is the business that will be run? Right. So uh, our table of uses has contractor shop with showroom. Um, it's really going to be a contractor shop. That was the closest matching um, item on our table of uses to line this up for B1. Mm -hmm. um, what he's planning on using the property for, and, and Gus Batista is here tonight, so he could, can... Could you come and give us a, a, yeah. a more accurate description of what your plans are, yeah. just so that I can... That used to be Don Harlow's Good place. evening. My name is Gus <laughs> Batista. Um, I live in the neighborhood, and I'm an electrician. Okay. And so basically it's going to be where I can go and do my books and look at prints. And I live two blocks from it, so that way my wife can keep an eye on me. And okay. uh, that's kind of what I'm going to do there. <laughs> you know, store my ladders and... Okay, and so it's going to be more like a storage space for... Um, and, and I guess the place where somebody can call you for your services? Yes. Okay, and you'll be keeping your, your wiring and your cables and your ladders and your spackles and yes. all, <laughs> whatever, <laughs> all that there. Okay, so the, you don't anticipate actually needing even uh, three parking spaces or maybe just one for a truck or I, I'm, I'm assuming you have a, a yes. truck or something that you work from. Yes, I have a van. Okay, a van. Mm -hmm. And um, so you'll be using that to, that's where you'll be parking your van and walking home? Um, <laughs> yeah, sometimes. <laughs> okay. Um, so I just wanted to get an understanding of, um, of wh how, y how the space would be presented within the, the neighborhood because I, I know what it used to be. Um, so it's just basically going to, to um, be your, um, your home office. That's correct. Okay. Eric. Uh, are you purely an electrical contractor or a more general contractor? Uh, electrician, electrical okay. contractor. <clears throat> Any other questions? Will the clerk please call the roll? Council members Brown. We had a motion already? Yes. Okay. Um, okay, I had one more question for Lily actually. Just the map on for, was this a map of the people that signed in favor? Is that in they favor, uh, they had an address associated to it and uh, that's, yeah, that's a map of the people who where they live. Okay, that's interesting. Um, okay, yes. <laughs> Hersey? Yes. Jacobson? Yes. Miller? Yes. Wu? Yes. That motion passes. Congratulations. Thank you. Congratulations. Thank you very much. <laughs> Next item is ordinance number 2019-08042, which is the ordinance approving the extension of final plat approval for the Union Garden subdivision, plan case 2364-S18. 
Lily will be presenting this one as well. And a representative of Union Gardens is in the audience tonight as well. Uh, this is this is a very short request. Um, as you can see in the staff memo, um, Kevin Garcia has done a very loving job of writing up. But basically, uh, the subdivision ordinance asks that the um, plat, the final plat after approval, needs to be recorded after 180 days. Um, Union Gardens has Trinitas Development LLC has requested an extension for a year. Um, if an ordinance is approved tonight, we can extend that that final uh, plat approval to to be recorded to a year. Is there a motion and then we'll have discussion. I move approval to extend the time for the plat to be recorded. I'll second it. Moved by Eric, seconded by Jared. Any questions for Lily or the Union Gardens representative? Mary Alice. So I'm just curious, um, are we approving it for one year since we approved um, let's see here. I'm, I'm just unless the uh, city council grants an extension. So right now it's at 180 days. But I, uh, when does the clock start? When does the for the one year clock so start? So it would be 180 days after the approval of city council is the impression that I've gotten. Yes, Lori Pearson. Lori. If you want to look at oops, if you want to look at section one. Um, in the ordinance, it says, is hereby extended for an additional one year period commencing upon the expiration of the original 180 day approval. So that's about now. So it's one year from today if it's approved. Or, it's not or one the year exact ex um, date that it expires. I don't know exactly, but it's around now. So one year from about now. One year from February 4th? No. From approximately no, from, now. From now, oh. August. We'll just go with August 5th yeah. plus or Roughly. minus. So I guess my question is, why a year? I would defer to the applicant to address that. And can you please state your name? I'm Kimberly Hansen. It's good to see you guys again. Um, so the, the year request actually just came because that would match with what we have from Champaign. I certainly hope we do not need a full year. That would be unusual. But um, the planner in Cham Champaign told me about a month ago that he needed to grant an extension, and he sent me a letter for a year. So then I thought, okay, I'll request a year here as well. All right. That makes sense. Thank you. Appreciate it. So you're depending on the construction in Champaign or the planner in Champaign to, regarding how you're going to have the final plat for Urbana? I'm just trying to. So our... Um, Development is in both Champaign and Urbana, yeah. so it just requires and the extension in both. We got approvals from both municipalities. Are they building already in Champaign? Not yet. No. Nope. Oh, interesting. Okay. Any other questions? Bill? Just a um, procedural question, I guess. Since this is our council meeting, not the committee of the whole, and this hadn't come to the committee of the whole before, and it wasn't forwarded by a committee, do we need to suspend the rules in order to consider it at this meeting? No, all of this is coming from the uh, um, Plan, Commission. Plan Commission or Zoning Board of Appeals, so we don't need. I don't think this one was. And I don't think the last one. I don't think the this one. This plat didn't require the, uh, approval by Plan housing. Commission. It came directly to you oh, because it's, it's of the also an or, It's an ordinance, so or, or, ordinances don't fall under that same rule. It's only resolutions that do. Okay, so for number five, the resolution will have to suspend the rules then? Yes. Okay, thanks. Any other questions? Will the clerk please call the roll? Trustees Brown? No. Hersey? No. Hmm. Jacobson? Yes. Miller? Yes. Wu? Yes. Requires four council members for approval. Our general rules require four, I believe. So this motion fails to pass. Mm -hmm. Is it is that? Is, can you verify that? 
Councillor? I believe it fails. Okay. So this will halt the entire project permanently? <laughs> I, no, just till we have a better understanding, at least for me, to have a better understanding of what the issue exactly is with UNET. I was just thinking, I'm sorry, am I speaking out of order? Um, I can call on you to speak. Sharice. Thank you. <laughs> okay, my, my initial problem is that I remember when all this was going down yes. and how everyone was in such a hurry to get it done. And if we don't, mm -hmm. oh, if we don't vote on it now, and blah, 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 it was one of the first things I think I had to vote on when I first got here. And now you're not doing something that um, was so rushed. So I would really like to understand why. Sure. I, I wish the answer was simple. There's I wish probably it was been a <laughs> mm -hmm. hundred tiny challenges on the way, but I along the way. But I think if you look at it from a bigger picture, it was more difficult than anticipated. Um, in order to close with debt and equity partners, you need <coughs> to be shovel ready, which includes approved engineering plans and approved building plans. With the two different ordinances and working with both cities to make sure we match requirements in both in different sections of the development has just taken a long time. Uh, we're very close, mm -hmm. <laughs> but we're just not there. But see, I, I, I remember, you know, in, in particularly because this is my ward, mm -hmm. I remember people saying how they weren't for it in my ward, including mm -hmm. myself at the time, and um, feeling the pressure of, um, it's basically a done deal and you know if it's not voted on right away then uh, I think you know people were talking about we'll go elsewhere blah 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 so it was a hurry up and wait kind of thing now mm -hmm. is what it is and so um, I want more information I want to know why you need a year why or I don't why you may think you may not need it, but why you even think you may need a year extension for something that seemed to be so hurried and rushed uh, back in February? I do not think we need a full year. The reason I'm requesting it is because that matches my approvals from Champaign, and I'm trying to keep parallel paths as much as I can. I understand that. Um, with a little luck we will start in September. We have a September 1 goal as a company. I do need to have building plan approval from Urbana and Champaign. I'm on my second round of reviews. I'm hopeful, but I can't, I don't have complete control on that being mm -hmm. a set date. Did so if it were to take longer than anticipated and things just have, um, we would wanna push till spring because it's hard to start construction in the winter. Mm -hmm. So. The timing does push out a little bit. Okay. Question? Question, yeah, just a clarification. Obviously, there's a lot of construction already in the Urbana side. Yes. Um, and so this has been able to proceed to this point without recording the plat. We do not own the land right now. Because you don't own the land but the construction is going forward. There's is no construction going on right now. No There's no construction. We have pulled no permits. This is north. We will not start Oh, I'm sorry, this is north of where the current construction is. Yeah, okay. Uh, I'm the sorry. The landmark property. I'm sorry. Yes. Okay, short circuit, short circuit. Uh, okay. <laughs> what, what, maybe you can clarify um, the consequences of um, uh, of not getting an extension, and maybe you can also yeah clarify 
how long an extension you think you actually need. Let me do a little math in my head. <laughs> okay. And why do you not own the land? I thought the land was owned. That's why we did all the rezoning and all that kind of stuff. And you, you don't own it? We do not own it. And if I may, it's um, often typical for a developer to purchase land under contract. And a typical provision of a contract, and I'm guessing that might be the case here, is that they need the uh, appropriate approvals from the jurisdictions. And in this case, those appropriate approvals, as my understanding, is the building permit, an issued building permit. So it's that piece that they don't have, and therefore they don't want to take possession of land until they know they can build on it. Okay, so my understanding is that this particular land that we rezoned or whatever we did so that they could get what they wanted was originally business industrial, correct? Under zoning? At least a portion of it, yes. Uh, another portion was a multifamily residential zoning, or uh, duplex zoning. Okay. Okay. Grocery store. Mary Alice, so uh, uh, sure, basically um, the uh, neighborhood just above Carver neighborhood, mm -hmm. that was multifamily. Okay. And then north of that was industrial. Was industrial. Yeah. So we rezoned that to all be residential. Right. I, I think we went to R4, if I remember it, it, correctly, R4 or R5. I can't I remember, can't remember which remember one. What but I just wanted to let you know yeah, that it was, our something. It was already abutting the the neighborhood was residential it wasn't um well zone i know it's behind culver i remember, I remember it's behind Cul Cul carver park but um and part of it was county and part of it was city am, am i correct in my my correct recall okay and that it um and one was i'm not sure which one was residential and one was industrial and they were re and we re rezoned. They both got rezoned so to to um, to accommodate that. I, my assumption then was at the time was that they owned the they owned the property. No, a prospective owner can purchase or excuse me, a prospective owner can apply to rezone um, property, and so it's it's structured so that it's. They're requesting a rezoning in order to do something to that land that the current property owner doesn't have an interest in doing. Mm -hmm. So that is why the developer requests it, because the current owner just wants to sell it, and they don't want to go through that process. Um, so in this case, what happened is the prospective developer and owner uh, went through those processes in order to get the um, what they're called our zoning entitlements in order to be kind of allowed to do what you want to do, but then they had to go through the process of the building permits, and um, I can only imagine, I mean, I see it on this end, um, how long it takes to get through the building permit process on a really complicated process or project, but then you put in another jurisdiction and their rules in it, um, I mean, that just perhaps not doubles it, but maybe even triples the, the level of complexity and perhaps the time even. Mm -hmm. So I think it's a combination of having it be a large project, but splitting the jurisdictions that really complicates the building permit process. And it takes a little bit longer for sure. Okay. See, this is a conversation I would have liked to have had before saying, okay, you got to vote on it. <laughs> <laughs> you, can, you can move to reconsider. Um, Did Champagne give you the extension? Yes. Okay, so Champagne gave you the extension. Eric? Is it an overstatement to say that if you can't extend the time for, um, for doing this maneuver that the entire project's in jeopardy? Yes. <laughs> it's not an overstatement. No. <laughs> That's an accurate statement. Okay. So my question then next is, would it, would it be um, uh, a problem if, uh, could you wait to the, could, well, at least could I get more information? Uh, I can't speak for everyone on the. We do have a deadline, however. Which what's is, the deadline? Uh, I need to calculate it for sure, but it's pretty much today, okay. unfortunately. And we do have a challenge the next two weeks. We're going to have three council members absent from the next two meetings yeah, I'm gonna be one of them. due to vacations and scheduled travel. 
I'm happy to answer any questions or explain. What's the what are the consequences if we don't if if it's not approved tonight? What are the consequences to them? Um, do you do you lose the the uh, authority of the property or? <laughs> so without the approval is the understanding I would go back so to planning no, commission and start the process over. Um, so this is just for the final plat, and I don't recall if you required any waivers. So mm -hmm. if you did not, then it basically they'd need to resubmit the plat. Staff would have to re-review it, send it out to um, outer agency review for them to re-review the plat and say whether or not they had any issues with it. Then we compile all of those comments and go um, then bring it uh, here for uh, reapproval of the same plat. From a developer perspective, um, we probably would lose control of our land. All of our subcontractor um, negotiations would be done. I mean, it, it would be very serious. In all likelihood, this will start within the next couple of months. Yes, Th that is the goal. The only reason we're asking for longer is you do hit winter at some point. Okay, so. Your goal is to is to begin construction in both Champaign and Urbana by the end of the month. I would have started in March if I could have, yeah. We're ready, we've been ready. It's just, it just takes time to work through the processes. Any other questions? Mary Alice. Sherry, I'm wondering if you would be more comfortable if the extension was for a shorter amount of time rather than a year three months, six months, whatever. I'm just curious. Is it the length of time that you're- It is the length of time because of the fact that I never got to actually get this under my brain in the first place. So yeah, maybe if it was a shorter amount of time, I wouldn't have a problem with extending it. Is that possible to do? Sure, the, um, the ordinance can certainly be amended to list a different time frame. Can we give them just another 180 days? Mm -hmm. Sure. Even Does though we've already defeated the motion? I, I don't know procedurally how this would be done. We can amend it. No, she needs to vote, move to reconsider. You'd have to move, somebody on the winning side has to move to reconsider, which in this case is B. Sharice or Bill. Uh, anybody can second it, and then a majority vote would, would allow for reconsideration of the motion. And then you can amend the original motion. Then you can amend motion. the original motion. So is there a motion for reconsideration? Okay, I'll move to reconsider. Second. So moved by Cherise mm -hmm. to reconsider, seconded by Eric. All those in favor say aye. 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 All those opposed, same sign. Okay, this motion is up for reconsideration. Is there another motion? I move to um, amend ordinance 2019-08042 an ordinance approving the extension of final plat approval, Union Garden Subdivision, plan case number 2364S18. Uh, I, I move to um, change the extension from a year to 180 days. Is that roughly and, February? An extension of 180 days. Well, but sweetie, if you're going, you said eventually winter's gonna come, so. <laughs> Winter is coming. You got a motion. <laughs> yep. Just know that. I'll uh, second the motion. <laughs> so that was moved and as amended by Sharice, seconded by Eric. Any further discussion? Dan? So just to clarify, is that a, a complete motion of moving the ordinance with 180 days as the, as the change, the or do we want to do a substitute? And Bill was raising his hand here, too. The extension. I'm, I'm just saying extension. You're amending it. section one where it says hereby extended for an additional one year period. You're changing that to 180 days. Com because from what I understand, from what Kimberly has said, correct? That's your name. Mm -hmm. um, they expect to actually begin, or she hopes that they will begin um, in um, that by the end of the month. If it moves, if it doesn't happen at the end of the month, then you may have to come back and ask for another extension. But I 
I'm not stopping all extensions. What I want is that there be something in in place. Like the she the hopes. original, yeah. Just the motion to reconsider puts the motion, the original motion, back on the table, which was second, was moved and seconded by Eric and and uh, Jared. And so you've moved an amendment. So what we to need to do next is vote on the amendment and then vote on the ordinance. And just okay. to be clear, this does not mean that construction will start in 180 days. It means that this plat is going to be recorded and they will have their building right. permit. Is that correct? Right. So this does not hold them to having bulldozers out there on the No, ground. they may not have bulldozers, but you, if, you, if you want a final plat, you've had time. You've had plenty of time to get that going. I, um, what I'm asking is that it not be extended for a year for a final plat. Um, okay. It, you know, okay. that it, that, right, that but you do get an extension. Okay, so that. we're voting on the amendment of 180 days. Um, is oh, that have, roll yeah. call or is that, is that all those in favor? I think Bill had a question. Oh. Bill. I just explained my vote. I voted against it originally because I thought the um, plat was deficient, didn't show some of the things that a final plat was supposed to show. Um, as far as I know, it hasn't been corrected, so I'm just trying to be consistent and vote no again. Okay. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 All those opposed, same sign. That amendment passes. Then we will vote on the full ordinance as amended. Uh, will the clerk please call the roll? Brown? No. Hersey? Yeah. Jacobson? Yes. Miller? Yes. Roberts? Or Wu? Yes. That has four votes. That motion passes. Thank you. Kimberly, tell your colleagues that they just about gave you a heart attack, and oh, now they better well, get it in gear or get this done. Being fired tomorrow, so that's <laughs> going to be really great. <laughs> okay, thank you. Uh huh. All right. Next on the agenda is Ordinance Number 2019-08-040, an ordinance amending the Urbana Zoning Ordinance for an Omnibus Text Amendment Two, Plan Case 2377-T19. Before Lily, you get started, I just want to explain um, to council why we have two separate ordinances for kind of the same thing. Um, we had started uh, Amendment 2 and started processing that through Plan Commission. Plan Commission had to cancel two meetings due to lack of quorum, and therefore uh, we had already queued up number three, so you're seeing them together. I hope that does not cause too much confusion. All right. First zoning ordinance omnibus of tonight which is the second don't get confused like I might um, so there's nine articles that are amended and plan commission uh, discussed this um, several times commuted uh, continued at various times due to lack of quorum as Lori mentioned um, during those that plan commission meeting there were two um, substantive issues that were discussed, um, really two that were um, fairly <laughs> large in the, in the omnibus. Most changes were really <coughs> clarifications or some references that need to be clarified. There were a couple things. Um, the first one um, was uh, second principal structures in R3 and other zoning districts being allowed by right if they meet all other development regulations. Um, and that would be just to match the density that is currently allowed in R3 but allow um, allow duplex density but in two structures um, on, on a one lot. Uh, we've been getting a lot of cases, the Zoning Board of Appeals has been hearing a lot of cases, so that was really interesting for Plan Commission to hear about and we discussed at length uh, the, that, that suggested change. Um, Just on that, you said two substantial uh, Second principal structures in R3 and other zoning districts. It's second principal structures in R3, but for other zoning districts, there's no limit, right? Yeah, there's no other, there's no limit. Um, multi, currently how the zoning ordinance is written, um, multi-family buildings are, are already kind of exempt from this. Um, and uh, for business and industrial, um, this could be a change in, this would be a change in allowing multiple stru principal structures, but and only if it would allow yeah. for within the development regulations. So. Currently we don't allow single family homes in multifamily. 
in R4, R5, R6 without a conditional use? Single family homes are allowed in, in higher level residential. Not more than one on a lot. In, you can't have a R5 with three or four single family homes on it without a conditional use or a subdivision. Uh, let me defer to, because Lori comes up with the large zoning ordinance. I'll get the exact section, but um, I think that would fall under the exception that she just said were multifamily zoning districts, but let me get that like that language. Yeah, it's currently. Okay, it's for multifamily structures, but not, not for single family or, or duplex structures. So this would be a major change for that. Yeah. I think that there's permitted by right single family homes, re dwelling units allowed in all multifamily areas. So you can have multiple structures that in those principal use of those structures could be single family homes. Section 5.2 before it uh, prohibited that, and you've changed it to allow that. So, Lily, are you basically talking about something like um, a two on a lot type of deal? Like you've got a, a, a single family home, and then you've got a garage with an apartment on top of it or something like that is yeah that? as the memo points out there in the past two years we've had a lot of people with the garage uh, apartment apartment mm -hmm. situation but there's also been a couple of people who have come to us talking to us about mother-in-law suites and most of these um, just to be clear because it, it's not very uh, clear when you're pulling out just a snippet of the zoning ordinance um, what this all of this kind of ties into mm -hmm. but when you do do that most of these are new projects so you um, you can't really take your garage and turn it into a garage no apartment. yeah no garage <laughs> conversions uh -huh. <laughs> it'd be incredibly hard maybe cost prohibitive um, and and so a lot of these cases have been coming to us um, to get a conditional <laughs> use for that second principal structure but it's going to be a, a rebuild of maybe a garage on the first floor an apartment above or maybe it's going to be a mother-in-law suite um, but they've been um, kind of getting conditional use for that and we wanted to provide a couple of protections for the city of Urbana for illegal subdivisions so we thought it would be an appropriate time to kind of address that and kind of allow us at least in R3 to to look at the rest of the building permit without having to go to Zoning Board of Appeals when Zoning Board of Appeals has been approving these. Okay. Lori, did you have something to add? Uh, so the text that Elderman Brown was discussing, I think, is uh, original text 5.3c.3. Uh, in zoning districts which permit multiple family residential uses, no conditional use permit shall be required to allow more than one multiple family residential building on a single lot. I will say that the way that that has been used, if you look at um, some development patterns, is that it has allowed um, a structure, more than one structure that looks like a single family home, but uh, because there are multiple ones on that lot that um, uh, I believe the interpretation was made in the past that you're looking at those are individual units. They might not be connected. They're just separate. But they're multiple units, and therefore it functions as a multiple family. Can you give an example of that? Um, so Highland Green um, is the first one that I can think of off the top of my head, where those are built as, uh, from a construction standpoint, as single family, or, or as, I think there's some duplexes there. But that is one large lot, and those are whatever number, 42 units or whatever it is on there. Um, so they're constructed from a single family standpoint, but from a zoning standpoint, those are multiple family because there's multiple families on one lot. So subdividing all of those to be single family would be um, really difficult to meet all of the zoning regs and have the public street might have killed the project, that kind of thing. And so having one lot uh, simplifies things in a lot of ways. And that wasn't done as a planned use development? No. And Sounds like it might be non-conforming to me. Uh, and it, just to clarify really fast too, it's a really a historical form of, of housing. Eric Jacobson mentioned that at a meeting when we had a, a second principal structure, but with also a, a major variance. So it came to council. It was in order to allow for a garage apartment in R3 um, that would allow the mother of the owner of the house to stay in that garage apartment as she ages and they'd be close together. Um, yeah. But the major variance was for a tree, and that was mentioned that 
a lot of historical homes would have a coach house of some sort and the lot. And that was, um, and that's something that it wasn't until really later in the 20th century that cities and municipalities, including Urbana, started not prohib uh, prohibiting, so. Yeah, I understand that argument. And I, I think that by itself is interesting um, to allow a second, a second structure. Um, it's interesting you picked R3 because actually some of the older homes are in R2 that, would, that had um, carriage houses. Um, but R3 is our biggest zoning district. Um, I mean, I think there's over 3,000 lots in R3. So I'm glad you um, clarified it to make sure that you couldn't have two duplexes on one lot because originally the way it was worded sounded like you could have two duplexes. I think actually that might have gone a little beyond it's actually more restrictive than what it was originally because now even with a conditional use you couldn't have because the way it says, it says no more than two principal structures and no more than two dwelling units are allowed per lot it doesn't say with a conditional use it might you might be able to do it so you might want to put that back in there that um that you know if you have a large r3 lot and there are a few um you might with a conditional use want to put two or three um, duplexes on it. Although that would then kick it into a, a multi-family sort of density and therefore the zoning perhaps should be changed to R4 or okay. the planning that's and a development. So just you want, so that's uh, more restrictive than it was before. I think my main concern is allowing single family in R4, R5, R6, every place where single family is normally allowed if you do the subdivision. Um, it seems like it's just easy, I mean, it's interesting because you could actually do tiny home developments. You know, That's you could do uh, a dozen tiny, ho tiny homes or something. But um, if you did that today, you'd either need to get a conditional use, a planned unit development, or let the zoning administrator consider it a mobile home park and treat it like a mobile home park, which is real restrictive. And we have 10 pages of regulations on that. So I'm wondering if we, if we have 10 pages of regulations on mobile home parks, and this is pretty similar to that, maybe we need some control over a development that has 20 or 30 little mm -hmm. tiny homes on it, mm -hmm. like mobile home parks say you can't have overhead electricity wires connecting the homes, things like that. Yeah, um, those are very different. Not, yeah. not to confuse those two, mobile home parks and tiny homes, they're not the same one would fill into. So there's, there's two different kinds of triggers that would come <laughs> along with that, so. Yeah, so I, I'm just worried that um, allowing it by right um, any number of single family homes by right in an R4, R5 district is, for one, a pretty major change for, a, um, for what, what normally is a textual, text amendments are normally grammatical <laughs> errors and putting in things and um, tables of contents and things like every other change in these two <laughs> are, but this is a major one and I think it probably should have been a separate planning case and I know there was a lot of discussion on it and I appreciate Plan Commission's discussion of the commercial uses and how this probably isn't going to be a problem in the commercial uses, but this one area does concern me. So I'd suggest taking out um, any changes to Section 5. Um, I really quickly would like to just address that a little bit, um, if I can. Currently, we're not making, suggesting any changes in density that is already currently allowed. So you could have an R4 property, and if it had the space to have those principal structures, you would just need a conditional use permit. Um, but you wouldn't need any variances to have multiple. And actually, I don't even think you would because, I'm sorry, you wouldn't need that because it's exempt to have those multiple uh, stru principal structures. A um, strict reading of the ordinance is what Alderman Brown is, is doing. And so I don't, what I think the language doesn't capture very well is our, the, some of the traditional housing types like cottage developments, for instance, that we might want to investigate going toward in order to um, increase density in a more neighborhood context sensitive way. But, um, and I don't, I don't know if Buena Vista is on individual lots, but it's that kind of development that we want to yeah. think about. That's the future probably. Um, so. I think, you know, clarifying, making this change, this clarification helps to recognize that that is an okay type of um, development. But if that's not something you're comfortable with, then uh, certainly we can, you know, 
um, address that more thoroughly because there's a lot of things that we think uh, the future holds and it would benefit the city of Urbana to look into doing. Um, but uh, if you're not ready for that yet, then, then that's fine. But I'm glad you brought up tiny homes because that is certainly something that I know that there's a lot of desire to allow um, and it's sort of been my, uh, what I've been hearing from people is that we should look at how to make that happen, not how to make that harder to happen. Well, so. I, th I think it could happen today with a conditional use, isn't that right? If we wanted to, you know. Um, and that would give, that would give plan commission. ZPA. Plan commission, ZPA. Some, it wouldn't give council any ability to do anything because conditional uses don't come to council, isn't that They right? go just as zoning board of appeals. The zoning board, right. yeah, so, so it gives the zoning board some opportunity to say you have to have a drive here, not there, you, um, you know, some access to building, you have to have 20 feet between buildings or whatever. Right, without that, there's really not much. Well, there's building code for things like that, yeah. for sure. And, and zoning other, ordinance. Right, so there, yeah. there, I mean, frankly, I think that there's enough, <laughs> there's enough in this book to, <laughs> um, to give them um, a lot of, requirements. There's also the subdivision ordinance which talks about things like how close, um, you know, if you're building a new road, how close that road can be to the next road, that kind of thing. Um, so there's certainly a lot of regulations um, and perhaps that's why we don't have any today is because there's so many layers of regulations. But, but it is something that ZBA has been considering for the past two years, many of those cases. And if you look at how many cases they get and then how many of them are people trying to establish these accessor uh, like second principle structures. Yeah, I don't have a problem with that, although even that I think um, it would have been worth um, having a separate plan case so that neighbors could have um, a, a better idea of what was going on. Any I questions? Any other questions? Charisse? See, because now I'm like really confused. Um, <laughs> my question is, and was going to be, with the 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 um, the re uh, verbalization of, or however you want to put it, the rewriting of of, it, of the R three thing about the second principle structures. Would that allow? Would that more uh, readily allow? A, a little subdivision of tiny homes would would that or would that or is this just for people who own property and they want to put the the you know garage apartment or is it something that could be used to develop th that type of of artist community well to have a community so if the R3 zoning district would only only allow you if this were to be approved would only allow you to have two units on that one piece of property mm -hmm. so i suppose if you amassed a number of those properties you could have two units per mm -hmm. um, uh, but to encourage something like a tiny home development you would probably have uh, more of an R4 or R5 zoning district which mm -hmm. is the multifamily districts that um, typically you would have, you know, an apartment building or two on, but yeah, but a tiny home isn't it? Isn't it designed for um, just one or two people to be uh, to live in that area? I'm, typically, I, I'm, per uh, unit. Yes. Yeah, so we deal unit. with units mm -hmm. in zoning. We don't deal with how many people are in that building. So zone. Zoning is looking at um, Bring down the game, how many people <laughs> per lot, mm -hmm. um, not okay. necessarily how many people per unit, um, at least in this regard. So I think what you're asking for, if you were going to do a tiny home development, would this thing on the R3 affect you? Probably not, unless you had a bunch of R3 individual lots, because you couldn't cram three tiny homes on uh, one, R3 one R3 lot. R3. Yeah. Okay. Because but R3 you could is designed... Two if this is approved. You could have two, two tiny homes on a lot, mm -hmm. and you're saying that it, you know if there were three or four consecutive lots, you could have eight tiny homes in right. an area. So the reason we brought this forward is, is because uh, we're really looking at, um, so today in R3, you can build a duplex as long as those units are touching one another. Mm -hmm. But what we're asking is, isn't it okay if those two units are not touching each other? 
Okay. Because it's the same mm -hmm. number of people, presumably, are going to live in that. It's mm -hmm. just a matter of, is there space between those units? And from a zoning perspective, we don't see that it has an impact, a negative impact on the neighborhood, and that's what zoning does, is it looks at impact at your neighbors, of mm -hmm. your neighbors. And so we don't see that there's a negative impact if you separate those units. So they don't have to be a a attached, in other words. Correct. So as, as it is now, it has to be attached. Correct. So that's the, that's the issue regarding the garage apartment and the house, is that they're usually not attached and so now we're going to allow them to be unattached. Correct. Which we currently, as Lori pointed out, allow duplex to come in with a building permit. It meets all other development regulations and it would be eventually approved. Okay. But we have this extra step mm -hmm. that CBA has been approving on a regular basis for the same kind of density, but to approve that density, so. Okay, I'm just, I'm just trying to understand the regulation. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Any other questions? Is that a, Mary Alice? So I, I know there's a lot in this and, and we've kind of jumped the gun here on the, the hot topic. So I do have questions on, on something else, but I don't know if you want to Did proceed. I yeah. Think, I think you have a present, you still you have, have a presentation. presentation. I mean, I have, right. I, I have the same concerns that, yeah. that Bill has and I appreciate that he brought those very specific instances up. Um, and I definitely want to address those as well, but I'm wondering perhaps we should finish this and then open up discussion. Sure. Well, actually, I've only, I, I have a presentation that I can provide, but it, I've set it up so that we could talk about some of the major okay. issues because everything is in the, the memo and what has been discussed. Um, so if you have, if there's something that you've seen and you have a question about, you know, I'm, I have to talk about non-commercial institutional electronic signs in B4 because that was also something, a concern that came up. Um, that staff has looked into. Um, but if there is a question besides that, um, I have the regulations here for those two, but I can pull up the regulations for, uh, for other parts that you might have uh, questions so about. So the, uh, the one about the Manual of Uniform Traffic Control Devices. Yes. Article, is that nine? Yeah, it's nine. Nine signs? Yep. Um, and private tra uh, directional traffic signs, yeah. Right, so amend the definition of private directional and instructional signs. So it says that MUTC does not regulate these types of signs. So what do they do? Yeah, MUTCD does not regulate those types of signs. It actually says it on their FAQ page uh, that they don't <laughs> regulate those types of signs. What they do is, so the manual uh, of uniform traffic control devices uh, will regulate all sorts of like the red lights, the stop signs, they need to be red, they need to be octa octagonal, they have to be a certain setback, they have mm -hmm. to be. Um, but they don't regulate those types of signs is what you're at saying. At this uh, speed, they have to be this big. Yeah, they don't regulate private directional signs, traffic signs. So that would be a really good example of that. Um, and when businesses fill out permits for that, they get extra points. Um, they, like a thank you, come in entry on like a, a drive through business, for instance, and then an exit sign to remind people, hey, this is the exit of the parking lot or the drive through um, Those are all ones that are well within the, um, the setbacks allowed. And so MUTCD, when we made that reference, they might have been regulating it then, but it was something that was probably for, for just an oversight that it's still in our zoning ordinance. MUTCD does not regulate that type of sign. Okay, but MUTC is something that regulates items. It doesn't just give suggestions on best best use. No, yeah. So okay, they I just I just wanted yeah. to make that clarification in, in terms of oh, do they have recommendations even if they don't even if they don't regulate those items? And yes. The answer to me is Sorry. no. They do not make those recommendations. They only regulate certain kinds of signs. Yes, not okay. all types of signs. Thank you. You can have a pirate flag, but they're not going to talk to you about that. They're going to talk to you about your stop sign. <laughs> Oh, okay, all right, no pirate flags. Um, the, my second question had to do, and there was a, a conversation at the Planning Commission about this, with the, um, there, was, there was a phrase that was being um, changed in terms of property owner. Yes, there was. Yeah. yeah. What was the other phrase? I'm sorry. Yeah. I so there are um, four different definitions of a property owner in the historic preservation article, and this was a recommendation that came from legal uh, division that we should maybe 
try to cut down on our different definitions of something that we're using and referring to with the intent of being the same thing. And so we tried to make that much more uniform by using one definition of property owner. And if you can kind of go back and you flip back to Article 2, Article 2 has a definition of owner that's included and it refers to our city code's definition of property owner, um, which is a little bit more um, helpful to not have as many uh, definitions floating around, especially since the two kind of work together. Um, but what we wanted to do is make sure that we uh, made it uniform for people when they're reading the historic preservation uh, article in the zoning ordinance they knew um, that we're talking about you know their real property or the house that's on the property as opposed to um, the four different ways that we were we were kind of doing it the parcel owner record and their owner parcel record. owner thank you that's the one that yeah. I was looking for and and the reason I wanted a clarification I was hoping that legal could Jim you could help me with this. So I don't know if this is the case in Illinois. I know it's the case in other states in which a parcel can be owned by somebody and the, and the actual building is owned by somebody else. You could do that. So is that allowed in the state of Illinois? In Illinois, yes. Okay. So does this definitional change affect that at all? Because a parcel to me is land. And an owner, a principal, a property owner, or somebody who owns a building. But that's just my right, and that should be defined in case you were ever confused as to what they're referring to, right? So, to the best of my knowledge, we're trying to cover and make that more uniform to talk about um, the the owner, the property owner. So the property owner is the building owner, not the person who owns the actual land that the building is sitting on. The landowner. So it's the land owner, so it's mm -hmm. the parcel owner. Lori. This, and, and Lori, please check that, because this has so. been continued a couple of times, so it's been a little while since I reviewed Article 12. Say that again, please. So uh, you, you can have somebody who owns the physical land, the soil, right? And you can have somebody who owns the structure that's on the land. It, it does not have to be the same individual. Correct. Okay, so since we're kind of merging a whole bunch of ownership titles here, the definitions that we're using for owners, um, does that mean that we're no longer differentiating between the person who owns the soil and the person who owns the structure, or does it matter? That, that's my question here. Well, right. The, the definition in the zoning ordinance of owner is a person having a legal or equitable interest in personal property or real property. The terms person, personal property, and real property and meaning set forth in the Urbana Code, which I will need to look up what um, I read it for plan commission. I do not remember what that said, but um, perhaps that gives a little more information under real property what it refers to. Do you happen to know off the top of your head? I can't, I can't, couldn't hear the last thing you said. I'm just wondering what the city code says uh, in terms of a definition for real property, because that is defined in the city code. I'd, I'd have to look it up, and I can look it up, but I will say, I'll give you an example. Uh, the medical building, and I don't know if it's this way now, the, the, the ownerships may have merged, but when the medical office building was built uh, in front of what is now OSF, one entity owned the land, another entity owned the medical office building. Now, there, I don't know what's happened since the closure of TIF 3. That's how I got involved with it. And I'll, owner, whether it's in the zoning ordinance or in our code, can be defined as anything the person adopting the ordinance or the code wishes it to be. Uh, normally, when you define owner, there, is a, there can be a problem, which is exactly what you're suggesting. Owner of what? And I'd have to dig into the city ordinance, and I can do that uh, while the discussion's going on. But off the top of my head, I don't know how our city code, separate from the zoning ordinance, I don't even know if it defines owner or where it defines owner. For instance, in the liquor code, owner's defined as the owner of the establishment or the premises. Uh, so owner may be used in different ordinances in different ways, depending on the nature or the purpose of the ordinance. 
I don't think we have a, to my recollection, I, I haven't come across it, but I haven't really searched for it. I don't think we have an omnibus definition of owner or unless defined elsewhere in the Urbana City Code, owner means X. Well, there's like two, I see two definitions, owners of record and parcel owner. And Mary Alice, you were talking about real property or somebody real property? I don't see anything like that, but what I do see, a, a parcel owner is an owner of record of a parcel and then you have the owner of record, the person or persons or corporation or other entity in whose name or names the property is held according to the last recorded deed in the records of the Champaign County Recorder. So what are we uh, amending? <laughs> I guess this one I want to know. Yeah, okay, so uh, what we're trying to do in Article 12 in general is to actually pro provide context to that in a uniform language for that. As far as the definitions, we are referring to a specific part of the Urbana City Code, which is Section 1-3. And I will say that uh, Assistant City Attorney uh, Kurt Borman has reviewed all of Article 12 to make sure that it makes sense and it's, uh, it actually addresses what we're talking about for owner and property. So I hope that helps. Eric. So according to Illinois.gov, the definition of real property, it includes the land and any permanent improvements to the land, like buildings, fences, landscaping, driveways, sewers, or drains. Uh, so, and, and I guess that the owner of that, my guess is that the owner of that, and maybe this was alluded to, would be defined by whoever Pays the taxes. Well, who, yeah, whoever the deed says owns the land. Uh, whoever, whatever it says in the recorder of deeds office. Right. And that building owner is a leasehold of uh, the property. Unfortunately, the definition in uh, one or Urbana City Code one three doesn't really answer your question. It says the word owner applied to a building or land shall include any part owner joint owner, tenant in common, tenant in partnership, joint tenant of the whole or part of such building or land. It doesn't say uh, owner means the owner of the land or the owner of the building or both because it depends on how, what context the word owner appears. So the owner, depending if it's a contract or something Elsewhere in the code, if the context suggests owner of the land, real property, in law we use, typically we use the term real property and personal property. Real property meaning real estate, personal property meaning tangible objects and contents. Some people use it as what we call chosen actions, meaning a right to sue. Uh, but lawyers differ on that one. But again, it, it's the context in which, based on this definition, uh, in which the word appears. So this, this definition doesn't alone answer the question. It sounds like you were going to add a definition of owner to Article 2. Has that been proposed? Yes, that's in Article 2, in, the, in your packet. And can you read that, please? Yeah, absolutely. Um, had the page. Oh, here we go. Owner, a personal, uh, a person having a legal or equitable interest in personal property or real property. The terms person, personal property, and real property have the meaning set forth in Urbana City Code Section 1-3 as amended. And I can pull that up on the screen too if you'd like. And Section 1-3 says what? Oh, so can I interject for code. one second to further, I hate to say it, muddy the water? because buildings normally, when they are built on, the prop, on property, are considered fixtures, i.e. they cannot be easily removed, in which case buildings become real estate as opposed to personal property. A trailer, a mobile home that's easily moved would typically be tangible personal property. Uh, this building that you're sitting in is real estate because it's firmly affixed to the premises. 
So again, we're back to whatever definition or use of the word owner you want, you want to put in context. It sounds like we need some more clarification on this. So let's just, um, when this comes to consideration, pull this section out so we can make sure we're all on the same page rather than go round and round on this tonight. Actually, w with that, I, I think perhaps the best thing is to um, hold this, put this back on to committee um, so we can have further conversations about this at the next meeting. Um, so I'm going to make a motion that this uh, ordinance number <coughs> 2019 -08040, ordinance amending the Urbana Zoning Ordinance, Omnibus Text Amendment 2, plan case number 2377-19, be sent back to committee. Second. Any further discussion? May I ask for clarification if there's any particular other items that have not been discussed already, if you could articulate ones that you want us to focus on so that we come prepared to the committee meeting? Okay. I, I have concern, I have the same concerns that Bill has in terms of, I believe it was Article 5. Um, I, there was a, as you said, a very robust conversation at the Planning Commission. I must say I really appreciate everybody's perspectives on there and enjoy watching their, their meetings. Um, I, I find it interesting that we are attempting to fix an issue by opening up a, a much larger door than the issue that we're trying to fix. Um, so the issue that we're trying to fix here are these garage conversions um, in R3. Um, but in addition to that, we're doing a whole bunch of other things. So I would prefer to see text in here that only addresses R3 and does not address any of the other zoning. That, that's my personal preference. I don't know what the rest of council would like to see. Bill. I think that'd be appropriate for the text amendment because um, I think, I think it would be all right to discuss that aspect, and that was discussed in the Plan Commission. The Plan Commission didn't discuss the potential for having tiny home developments. It was, didn't even come up. So I'd feel uncomfortable passing something that would allow that sort of development when it, they didn't even consider it, and it wasn't in the memo, it wasn't advertised. Um, so yeah, I think addressing the um, second principle structure on NR3 would be appropriate for, for that section. Any other things to add for staff to look at specifically? Sharice? Well, I'm not going to say for staff to look at, for me to look at, because I'm going to need some tutoring, Lori. <laughs> if you could kind of give me a, like take a half hour sometime, not this week, but next week or something. I don't know when. Anyway, I'll, uh, 40, half hour, 45 minutes to just give me a tutoring session session so that I can understand what I'm voting for or against regarding the zoning the zoning ordinances I have have the book but so if you could help help me do that I would appreciate it okay so at this point we have to clarify the definition of owner and we're also looking at um, second principal structure in R3 and if, if people come up with other items that you want staff to address in this particular one just send Lori an email and then we'll make sure everyone knows Jared just a quick comment to Lily and Lori in uh, support of what Bill and Mary Alice are saying I think I also saw the same thing in some of these sections and I think uh, a lot of discussion I've had with John and you guys over the years of where problems arose in some of the neighborhoods in my ward were a lack of clarification and a lack of uh, purpose, we'll say, in uh, the way zoning was written because it was kind of, well, these people thought this was a good idea at the time, but then the ambiguity of the language allowed for uses that turned in, uh, to be inappropriate for the area later on down the line. And I just think what we're all looking for here is uh, purposefulness in our language rather than ambiguity that allows for and I'm sure you guys know this but you know that's I think that's what we're after if that helps guide your principle of looking at that uh, going forward we share that goal so. 
Okay, so this, um, let's see, where are we? We have a motion to send this to committee, and that was made by Mary Alice. Who seconded that? Me. Sharice. Okay. <laughs> Does that require a roll call, or uh, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 All those opposed, same sign. All right, that heads back to committee. Next up is uh, ordinance number 2019-08-041. All right, so this is the last omnibus uh, for tonight. Um, and it's the third. We have seven articles or amendment. In, in general, this is a much shorter omnibus uh, text amendment being proposed tonight um, than the previous one that was heard. Um, I'm going to go through this again fairly quickly um, and love to take questions. Plan Commission voted unanimously to recommend approval to, from City Council uh, and there was no public input for this plan case, 2384-T-19. Uh, um, and I have staff findings. So. The proposed amendment will assist with daily administration and enforcement of the zoning ordinance by improving clarity and updating language to meet current professional practices. The proposed amendment is consistent with the goals and objectives of the 2005 Urbana Comprehensive Plan regarding updating various sections of the zoning ordinance. Three, the proposed amendment will update the zoning ordinance to ensure that the regulatory environment more closely matches the goals and policies of the city. Four, the proposed amendment conforms to the notification and other requirements for the zoning ordinances as required by the State uh, Zoning Act. And the options for City Council, the following are, are your options. One, approve the ordinance as presented. Two, approve the ordinance as modified by specific suggested changes. Or three, deny the ordinance. Um, the recommendation at its July 18, 2019 meeting, the Plan Commission voted seven A's and zero nays to forward to City Council with a recommendation to approve the proposed text amendment to revise multiple parts of the zoning ordinance. Staff concurs with this recommendation. I should just point out that Alderman Roberts did email me about um, an item specifically related to the powers and duties of Plan Commission. Um, I believe he was suggesting that some more detailed things be added to that section, whereas the text amendment suggests that we take out all those details and refer back to the city code. Um, so I think perhaps this is a longer conversation that isn't necessarily um, would work well with what's on the table tonight, but perhaps is a, is a different conversation about the city code. So um, I could read his comments if you would like, if that's helpful. Um, yeah, please. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay, so um, he suggests adding an item or two to the revision, uh, and then he refers specifically to Article Eight, excuse me, Article Eleven, administration, um, add reference to the Urbana City Code for the powers and duties of Plan Commission. Uh, his comment states regarding the item below: Is it possible to add also reference to the Urbana City Council's goals? Um, so the powers and duties right now, what they say are. Um, they ref kind of refer back a little bit to the city code, and then they talk about a few other things, including um, hearing Champaign County Zoning Board of Appeals cases. One of the reasons we wanted to refer back to city code is to allow Champaign County Zoning Board of Appeals cases to come directly to this body, as was discussed, I think, in the April meeting, um, uh, particularly for perfunctory items that really don't make a lot of sense to convene an entire body just to discuss something that's uh, slam dunk, as they say in the business. Um, so it was discussed that perhaps those could come directly here to continue his comments. Uh, there are issues which come to the plan commission which need to have more consideration for the improvements of the aesthetics of the surrounding neighborhood and improving designs presented beyond how the project meets the parking requirements or the floor area ratios, et cetera, which, which are mathematical decisions but not qualitative decisions. The ZBA and Plan Commission ought to safeguard the aesthetic appearance of a design as well as the structural aspect of a design. I appreciate a step in this direction by adding reference to the Urbana 
overlay district to the ordinance. Just a note on that, what we did was we added it to the table of contents that was a previous text amendment about three years ago to continue his comments. Note, the City Council of Champaign turned down a recent design proposed by Green Street Realty based on a lack of design quality and they had adopted a design standard upon which to base the refusal and they stood by it, citing the News Gazette story. Um, just a comment on that, um, a lot of, well, all of the zoning cases that come before you need to be approved on a number of different criteria, um, and some of those are outlined in the zoning ordinance, others are based on case law, um, for instance, rezonings, we refer to the LaSalle criteria, so there's not a lot of wiggle room to add in extra stuff, like you should also take into account X, Y, and Z, so um, it is for those reasons that I, that I didn't think that we should um, jam something into the powers and duties for plan commission as this text amendment because it is um, it's I would need more clarification on his intent to be honest and then he mentions a couple of other things which I did not um, find a way to insert into the powers and duties of plan commission but uh, I wanted to bring this to your attention that he did contact me about this um, but I'm not sure that uh, he and I were on the same page in terms of what the what the amendment was suggesting to do. So in the absence of being able to talk to him, um, I wanted to at least bring this up, but, but mention that uh, I couldn't find a way to accommodate this in an in a easy fashion, you know, the day of the meeting. Questions, Mary Alice? So is the intent um, in Article 11, uh, Section A, what is this? 11-2C, powers and duties of the plan commission, refer to chapter 18 of the Urbana City Code, is the purpose of striking everything there so that you don't have redundancy or inconsistencies between the city code and, and the zoning, is that, is that correct? Um, it is, in addition to simplifying things. So at one point it was added that the plan commission needs to consider, uh, needs to consider all Champaign County ZBA cases, which means if we're, if the county's processing something in a hurry and we don't happen to have a plan commission meeting, then we have to convene a special one just to hear something. Whereas if it's not in here, then we have the flexibility if we work out if something needs to be added to city code, but we at least have some flexibility to skip that step. Um, but in instances where we have the time and you want it to go to plan commission, sure, the city code uh, grants you powers germane to the, um, or grants the plan commission to other powers germane to the powers granted by this article as may be conferred by the city council. So you can ask them to do whatever, but that doesn't, you know, you don't need to necessarily write it in here because that limits your flexibility. Okay, so now I'm actually confused. I'm um, sorry. <laughs> so how would city council direct the plan commission to look at items from the county if we don't know if they're, I mean, we don't, we don't, manage their agenda or anything. So I'm trying to figure out how city council would give that direction to planning commission. Well, a um, couple ways. It could come here and you could say, I need more information. Probably more likely it would be staff would say, wow, this is, this is one that looks a little hairy. Let me talk to the mayor. Okay, the mayor might agree. Yeah, this is one that looks a little hairy. Perhaps planning commission should look at it first. But um, as I think we reported uh, in an um, Perhaps we didn't report it here, but I think it's something like 99% of the Champaign County ZBA cases that come before this body are not protested. Yet we are convening a plan commission meeting to discuss items that 99% of the time do not get protested. So perhaps they should only be used in those cases where there's a potential there, that there's an issue that's been identified, that it could potentially have a negative impact on the city of Urbana. Um, and so what uh, this change does, and I don't know if it gets there 100%, but it gets us closer anyway to not requiring us, even if there's no time to do it, even if we don't have a quorum, not requiring us to take all of these items to plan commission. So I, I guess perhaps one way to address um, Alderman Roberts' concerns about uh, striking this information from the plan commission is to actually review the Urbana City Code, which defines the powers and duties of the Plan Commission, and if there are items there that should be uh, clarified, then to add those there. It makes sense to me to have 
Um, so we don't want to be duplicating things and then messing up and not updating things between two sources. So it makes sense to me to have something refer to the Urbana City Code, but at the same time, we need to look at the City Code to make sure that that reflects what we believe the Plan Commission, um, their operation should be. And so I will just point out that I'm not sure Alderman Roberts was concerned with he didn't say anything about having a concern about removing the text. He was just suggesting adding. we add more stuff to it. So it would be adding, okay, adding more stuff to and I'd be to it. So um, the city it, that, that would be that would be something with the Urbana City Code that we should look at, I guess. Uh, which, yeah, is not under um, discussion tonight. But Correct. I could I could read for you or summarize if you'd prefer the uh, City Code section on the powers of the. Actually, it'd be great if you could just email it to. I Council, will do that. I so that I mean, a lot of it is very much the same, but it's just, it's a little bit different, which just seems strange. Right. Thank you. Any other questions? Mm -hmm. Jared. Oh, I uh, just wanted to bring to everyone's uh, attention, when you made that motion, Mary Alice, uh, we moved it to committee, but then it occurred to me that you were mentioning earlier, we're gonna have three council members gone for the next two meetings and it might not behoove of us to discuss this at a meeting with only four uh, council members or committee members and perhaps I don't know if we could just do it by voice uh, approval but maybe we need to move it to the next committee meeting after that which would be on the 26th and not next week because we're not going to have folks here still that's going to uh, we'll have to look at the agenda for that when we that's going to be a big one so if so yeah. I, I know there's probably a big, big or maybe needs to go th three from, from now, unless it's that pressing that it needs to be done. Either In either case, we're going to be short next week. So any pe folks who want to have comments, I mean, we either got to plan carefully for you guys to get involved, or we've got to push it further down the line. Is this time sensitive? Um, this former ordinance or this ordinance? Former. former. The f thank you. Um, the former one, the only thing that's, um, that was requested of us, uh, there is a church in the B4 district that has expressed an interest in, in putting up an electronic message board in their, um, their sign. Uh, that is the only one that I know about that is pressing um, mm -hmm. on that one until we get another. Actually, there is a, someone that uh, would need to submit a conditional use permit to put a a garage apartment or something like that on their R3 <laughs> lot but so if, if we got to run it through the process we run it through the process okay. know about that one. so <coughs> perhaps the uh, first com committee meeting of September would be appropriate rather than uh, next week okay procedure for that do we um, can we just I uh, yeah. Send it to committee. We'll we'll just yeah. designate that as the committee to send it to. Okay, that. that's all I was getting at. Okay, I knew we we're going to be right. short. Next that's time. a good thought. Thank you, Jerry. Thank you. All right, we are. Um, oh, I also had a motion. That's great, Jared. Uh, <laughs> I was going to move uh, approval of ordinance number twenty nineteen dash zero eight zero four one and ordinance amending the Urbana zoning ordinance uh, omnibus text amendment number three plan case number twenty three eighty four dash t dash nineteen. Uh, with the condition that we uh, remove the section that uh, Dennis brought up for further discussion unless uh, we feel like we don't want to wait for Dennis's comments on that. I, I believe the decision was that the changes would be made to the city code rather than doing the condition, the changes that he recommended. Is that, the so is that separate from what the ordinance says then? Yes. Or at least, um, talk about it more rather than writing language on the fly. It, right. His right. is very specific, whereas um, typically this language is more broad to give city council the ability to direct, you know, the No, I, underst I understand his intents, but I don't think we can, I think what you were saying is that we cannot pass this ordinance without further clarification of that section, correct? I might, well. That's what I. That's what I was understanding. My understanding was we could re keep the flexibility contained in this language, but 
clarify our Urbana City Code to whatever you wish it to say with regard to the plan commission duties. I, okay, I understand. Well, I, I, I will withdraw the amend, that amended okay. por portion of my motion and just make a motion to pass it as uh, stated. Okay, so is there a second? And I know, Eric, you had a, your hand up, but do we, can we get a it's second? A motion to pass it as stated, Eric. I'll second that. Okay, moved by Jared, seconded by Mary Alice. Uh, Eric. I just looked up that section of the city uh, ordinance online, and maybe I'm reading it too quickly, but as far as I can tell, practically everything that the plan commission does is as specified by us. The ordinance, the ordinance doesn't give the plan commission the power to review any of this stuff that it does. So if we strip all of that out, um, maybe I'm reading it too quickly. Could you help me understand? So yeah, I'm looking at chapter 18 and then, then article two, plan commission. And um, so we've got the composition, terms of members, organization, officers, composition, powers. And this is to prepare and recommend a comprehensive plan Etc. Cetera, Etc. Cetera. To uh, prepare and recommend to the council from time to time plans for specific improvements in pursuance of the official plan. To give aid to officials of the city charged with the direction of uh, projects for improvements embraced within the official plan. And then finally, to exercise such powers, such other powers germane to the powers granted by this article, as may be conferred by the city council. And then all the things that are in there now that you're proposing to strike out are those powers that are recommended by the city council. So I don't think that they're left with the power to do what they spend most of their time doing. Mm -hmm. <laughs> if, if we take your text as it's presented to us. So what I'd like to do is, is propose an amendment to that actually recovers the amendment that Jared originally said, and just to strike out of what we're considering tonight, that um, that C, where uh, and and so referring to chapter you're, you're talking about un chapter undoing the strikeout. Und yes, undoing the strikeout, undoing the strikeout of all of those things, and let's reconsider that because if I'm reading this correctly. Uh, and, How about um, I'll talk to our legal staff separately to see if, because it was my understanding in discussing with member of the staff, uh, not not Jim, but um, that number four was pretty broad and could cover a lot of these things. But we can have that discussion offline and let's uh, have back to you. let's have the discussion because and and maybe maybe I've maybe I, I've just you know I hadn't read that section of the ordinance before, but. Uh, I'm trying to read it really quickly. The it alternative. Seems to, it seems to me that we're really gutting what the plan commission uh, is empowered to do. The al well, I think um, to Alder Person Wu's um, comment, perhaps then what needs to happen is that the city code needs to encompass things rather than having powers and duties split among two different documents that sometimes don't say exactly the same thing. So I think that's perfectly fine but you know it, it uh, I'm concerned that if we if we pass the ordinance as it is that a whole bunch of stuff will have fallen through the cracks then I suggest you uh, move to unstrike um, see powers and duties for the time being until we can clarify city code I think that was his motion um, yeah if I may so if you if or you do that then if we decide that um, either that number four in this provision is broad enough to cover everything or um, I guess my point is then we will have to <coughs> make this another case and re-advertise this and go through the process again if we were um, okay with uh, either as it is or with adding things to the city code so my preference would be just from a, a streamlining standpoint is to and there's nothing in here, Lily, that is time sensitive. Mm -mm. Um, just hold on to this one too until we figure it out and come back to you with um, clarity. Okay. 
Because that might be, well, let's just change, uh, propose changes to the city code. Okay, I'm, I'm good with that. I'm good with that. In, in <laughs> such case, I will suspend my motion and amend, can I make an alternate motion then? Yes, please. All right, I, I will move that we uh, keep this ordinance uh, number 2019-041 uh, also sent to the appropriate next committee of the whole meeting, likely beginning of September. I will second that. So that's m motion by Jared, seconded by Mary Alice to send this to the uh, next appropriate committee meeting, which will be in September, and we'll set a date quickly. Okay. Don't we have to vote on it? All those in favor, please say aye. 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 All those opposed, thank you. Last item on the agenda under new business is resolution number 2019-08-031R, resolution approving an intergovernmental agreement with the Board of Trustees of the University of Illinois concerning certified housing inspections. And can you, um, do we need to suspend rules? We need to, we need to suspend the resolution on resolutions for this one. I'll move to suspend the resolution on resolutions to allow consideration of this resolution. Oh. Is there I'll a second, second the this, this suspension. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 All those opposed, same sign. Great. Okay. We have, um, who's presenting? Um, I'd, um, I'd like to thank the council for suspending the <laughs> rules for this. Um, the only reason we, I just wanted to mention the only reason we were presenting it tonight was for time purposes, we just got through this process with the University of Illinois, and um, I'm going to introduce Nick Hansen, our um, recently promoted to Housing Inspector 2, Code Compliance Supervisor. He's going to explain it, but Nick um, will start inspections September 4th, and in order for us to get this to the University of Illinois, get it signed, and so forth, we needed to present tonight for council approval consideration. All right, so before you have a three-year intergovernmental agreement with the University of Illinois Board of Trustees regarding the private certified housing. Uh, this includes uh, the option to renew two times for two additional years each time. Um, this proposed agreement also includes a 2% two per, two annual increase. Uh, the agreement was reviewed by the city attorney. Uh, staff did have concern with item number 10, as you will see, uh, per the U of I legal. Uh, that we were told to strike it out and initial it, and they were good with that. So staff recommends approval of this uh, intergovernmental agreement. Any uh, technical questions for Nick? No, but I do have a motion. I, uh, Mary Alice? I have a technical question. Uh, so we're doing all this work for the um, certified housing to make sure that they're all up to code and you know students are safe and so forth approximately how much time do we spend doing this rough numbers rough numbers probably 100 hours 10 hours I would estimate somewhere around 50 hours okay. d depending it depends on the number of year depends on the number of violations how many times we have to work sure. with them so just between, I would say between 50 and 100 off the top of my head. Okay, thank you. That was my one technical Is there question. a motion? Uh, I'd move resolution number 2019-08-031R, resolution approving an intergovernmental agreement with the Board of Trustees of the University of Illinois concerning certified housing inspections for a term of 2019 to 2022 be approved. Is there I'll a second? I'll second the motion. Moved by Jared, seconded by Eric. Further discussion? I, I would like. Um, do you have a question, sure? I'm not sure if I do. I was thinking, because it just says universities certified housing program. Will you inspect their dorms or their apartments or? Correct, the private certified housing. So that includes mostly fraternities and sororities. Oh. Okay, and so. And then you tell them what they have to bring up to code or. Correct. So typically, just like we do any other residential inspection, we'll give them a notice of violations, and then we'll go back and do a reinspection. And if they don't come up to code, you close down the fraternity house and no more keggers. 
No, typically the certified housing actually requires them to be inspected, and so they hold a very tight leash uh -huh. um, on the fraternities and sororities to make sure that they come into compliance. Uh, if they do not come into compliance with our notices, then they can actually be removed from the private certified housing list. Uh, so, okay. And, but you don't close them down. You just remove them from the list. So that's, that's basically, that's their decision on that. I mean, typically we've not had an issue with anybody not getting things taken care of. Okay. We work very closely with the university, with the certified housing folks. Oh, okay. Just to explain maybe a little, um, this, the University um, of Illinois has a certified housing section. Mm -hmm. And our staff works directly with them. And they manage the certified housing, all the houses on both sides of Wright Street. If we have an issue, and we've had this before, where we notify both the house and the certified housing office, and then the certified housing office works with us to make sure that the code is complied with. And if it isn't, mm -hmm. then the certified housing office will close them down. That's not up to us to close them down. That's their decision. But we just work to make sure, and then we notify them if there are any So issues. if Busey Evans doesn't meet the, the housing code or something, then you say to U of I, you know. So correct. So you have the private certified housing um, basically gives you three chances. So you have an inspection, and they will allow two reinspections before there's repercussions through the university. Okay. So if they exceed more than two reinspections, then you know, then the university private certified housing handles the issue. Okay. So does does the city of Urbana uh, assist in any way as as far as making these houses come up to code, or we just leave all that up to uh, U of I? That's up to the house owner, actually. They're oh. privately owned housing buildings, privately owned rooming houses, sororities, mm -hmm. fraternities are all, all privately owned, so it's up to them to do that using their own finances. Okie dokie. So you mentioned Busey Evans, that's a dorm. We don't We don't inspect dorms. That's what I was asking if they did yeah. dorms or if they, you know, or if it was just frat houses and sorority houses. These are private homes. Okay. Private yeah, homes. The, I mean, some are private, or some are sororities, some are uh, fraternities, some are privately owned uh, properties. So, but again, not all sororities or fraternities are part of certified housing. Certified housing basically is where the freshmen are allowed to stay. Where, okay, where the freshmen are allowed to stay. Thank you that for, for um, defining that for me. Okay. Okay, we have a motion on the floor made by Jared, seconded by Eric. Uh, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Roll call. Roll call. Roll call. Roll call. Okay. okay. Will the clerk please call the roll? Uh, Council members Brown? Yes. Hazen or Hersey? Yes. Jacobson? Yes. Miller? Yes. And Wu? Yes. That resolution passes. Last items on the agenda are appointments to boards and commissions. Um, appointment, I'm going to take the appointments um, as a group and then the reappointments as a group. For the UC2B uh, board, Paul Hickson, term to expire August 1st, 2022. <laughs> For Champaign County Economic Development Development Corporation Board, Brandon Boys, Economic Development Manager. And Brandon will be uh, president of the board, actually. Um, for the Urbana Business Association Board, Rachel Storm, who's our current Arts and Culture Coordinator. And for the Visit Champaign County Board, uh, Bridget Broyhan, who's our Communications Specialist. I'll move approval of those appointments. A second. Moved by Jared, seconded by Charisse. Will um, all those in favor please say aye. aye? Aye. All those opposed? That motion passes. Reappointments um, to the Fireman's Pension Board Fund Board of Trustees, uh, the term ending June 30th, 2021. Uh, Richard Schnoer and Police Pension Fund Board. Uh, I believe this is a two-year term as well. That's not the correct date there, but that would be Elizabeth Hannon. That's June 30th, 2021. Um, is there a motion? Yeah, I move approval. Second. All right. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 All those opposed, same sign. That motion passes. Last on the other agenda is the 
close minutes. Resolution number. Uh, resolution 2019-08-030R, which is a resolution regarding the release of closed session minutes for the period ending June 30th, 2019. Move approval. No, Second. Actually, actually, this also needs the suspension of the rules. Oh, I'd, I'd move uh, to suspend the resolution on resolutions uh, to allow a vote on this resolution. Is there Second. a second? Moved by Jared, seconded by Mary Alice. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. All those opposed, same sign. Is there a motion for the resolution? I'll make a resolution for number 2019-08-030R, resolution regarding the release of closed sessions minutes for the period ending June 30th, 2019, for approval. I'll second the motion. Motion by Mary Alice, second by Bill. Any discussion? Will, uh, is this a res, uh, Roll call. Ro yeah. Roll call. Yeah. Uh, Council Member Brown? Yes. Hersey? Yes. Jacobson? Yes. Miller? Yes. And Wu? Yes. That motion passes. With no further business before the council, we are adjourned.